Ooh, I'm going to be I'm going to begin our recording and start our agenda. Thank you everyone for being here this afternoon. My name is Andy Lanier. I'm the Marine Affairs Coordinator for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. You are here for the further evaluation workshop for the Ecola Point Marine Conservation Area and the Chapman Point Marine Conservation Area. Uh, thank you for all joining on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I am the Marine Affairs Coordinator and I work for the Oregon Coastal Management Program, which is a part of the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. I'm going to get us uh, oriented today by uh, doing a brief overview of the workshop. Uh, this workshop is the fifth in a series of further evaluation workshops that we've hosted this week. Uh, we've had some great conversations so far, so I'm looking forward to our conversation and our discussion today. I would like to actually uh, spend the time to go through and do introductions, both for our panelists and members of the public. So uh, I'll walk us through that in just a moment after I kind of walk us through the rest of our agenda today. We will have a public comment opportunity right after our, our welcome and introductions. I will spend a few minutes talking about our tribal consultative duties as a government uh, with our coastal tribal government nations. Uh, we will then launch into a, a presentation of the two proposal areas by the proposal team that is, has joined us today. Uh, following that presentation, we'll have a, a short break and then we'll enter into the meat of our discussion uh, this afternoon, which is focused around the uh, evaluation and the recommendations that were provided as a part of the initial proposal process that considered the Rocky Habitats as part of the amendment of the Rocky Habitat Management Strategy. Uh, we, I would like to provide another public comment opportunity towards the end of the meeting after the discussion. Um, and then I will conclude with a, a workshop wrap up and next steps. So uh, for the purposes of introductions, uh, I am going to stop sharing my screen so that I can uh, see everyone. And what I'd first like to do is go through uh, and introduce our panelists for the E. coli and Chapman Point uh, proposals. And I'm going to start with uh, Jesse, and then I'll go with Pamela and Mickey following Jesse. Thank you, Andy, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Jones, and I am here representing Oregon Shores and Coast Watch. Um, I have uh, taken over uh, leading at the North Coast group since last year when Margaret Treadwell moved on. Happy to be here. Thank you. Pamela? Pamela looks like she might be on the phone. I'm not hearing you, Pamela. Or oh, actually, uh, so let's move on to Mickey. Sure, I'm a resident of Cannon Beach and one of the presenters today to hopefully show you the special things about Ecola and Chapman Point. Thank you, uh, Angela Whitlock. Hi, I'm Angela Whitlock. I am a member of the North Coast Rocky Habitat Coalition and a marine educator. I work for both Haystack Rock Awareness Program and the Tide Pool Ambassador Program at Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. Great, thank you. Uh, Tabia. Yes, I am also a local resident here. I am a wildlife volunteer. I have worked at the Wildlife Center in the past working with um, US Fish and Wildlife and Audubon now doing bird surveys and um, part of the North Coast Rocky Habitat. Thank you. Uh, Joe Liebeseit. Hey everybody, my name is Joe Liebeseit. I am part of the uh, North Coast Coalition as well, but I'm also an employee of Portland Audubon and um, also on OPAC as a statewide conservation, uh, uh, holding the statewide conservation seat. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Margaret. Hi, hi, Andy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Margaret Treadwell. Um, as Jesse mentioned, um, until I guess it was June of last year, I was working with the community group on developing the proposals. And um, I'm just happy to be here with you all today. Um, I've since relocated to the Central Coast. So, um, but thanks for inviting me. 
Okay, Jesse, can you have I missed anyone from your team? Um, Deb Atia. Deb, sorry. Hi, my name is Deb Atia, and I'm on the North Coast Rocky Habitat Group, and I have been instrumental with um, helping with the fireworks ban in Cannon Beach. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I will transition to introductions for our agency staff panelists who are participating today. And I see uh, Sean Stevenson first on my list. Sean Stevenson, uh, I'm a wildlife biologist for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Oregon Coast National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Thank you, Sean. Guy? Good afternoon, everybody. Guy Rodriguez, the Central Resource Manager for Oregon State Parks that oversees the Ocean Shore Program as well. Thank you. Uh, Michael. Uh, hi, folks. Michael Moses with uh, DLCD. I'm the Estuary and Resilience Coordinator and former Rocky Shores Coordinator. Thank you. Uh, Dave Fox. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Fox with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Marine Resources Program. Great. Uh, Chris Parkins. I think you're OPRD, right? I am. Yes. Sorry. Okay. I'm really having technology challenges today, and they're all attributed to me, not my technology. Chris, Chris <laughs> Parkins with Oregon State Parks, the Coastal Park Resource Program Manager. Thank you. Thank you. I am not seeing Laurel Hillman yet. Is, is anyone seeing Laurel on? Okay, well, I imagine Laura will be joining us shortly. She told me she was going to be joining Andy. Okay. Uh, I do see Mandy. Mandy, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, she may be away from her desk at the moment. Okay, so I believe that's all of the, the state agency staff who are here today as panelists. And now I'm going to go... Mm -hmm. We Quickly. also have Justin Parker and Ben Cox on the call today. Thank you, Guy. Let's let's go ahead, uh, Justin, and then Ben. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, Justin Parker, uh, State Parks, the North Coast District Manager. Happy to be here. Thanks for being here. Hello there, uh, Ben Cox. Um, I'm the Mahalan Bay Management Unit Manager, which includes uh, Chapman Point and Nicola Point. Excellent. Did I miss anybody from our agency staff? I don't think so. Okay, and then let's um, let's quickly go through uh, members of the public who are in attendance. Uh, I see Jason uh, Schmerhorn. There, Jason Schmerhorn, uh, Cam Beach Police Chief, and also uh, representing the Cam Beach Fire and Rescue. Thank you for being here today, uh, Pamela Avil. Hi, I am just a local person who cares about the birds, and I have volunteered um, doing the um, Rocky Shores uh, bird nesting pattern um, project with Tabea. Thank you for being here. Uh, Sharon Heinrich. Oh, you're on mute, Sharon. I'm gonna see if that gets it. Okay, let's, uh, Sharon, when you figure out your mute, I'll uh, allow you to introduce yourself. How about Kelly? Yeah, hi, I'm Kelly Ennis. I'm the director of the Haystack Rock Awareness Program at the city of Cannon Beach. And um, we run a education program at the Haystack Rock Marine Garden. Thank you for being here. Sharon, I think you're unmuted now. Uh, yes, I'm just a resident here at Cannon Beach and I'm very interested uh, in what you folks have to say today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Kirsten Byens. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kristen Bands. I'm the Marine Program Coordinator for the North Coast. Oh, your audio just cut out for me, at least. Um, 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm in charge of the Marine Program, which includes outreach and public programming for the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Peggy Joyce. Uh, I am Peggy Joyce, and I'm a board member of OPAC. Thank you, Peggy. And Nadia Gardner. Nadia Gardner, 20-year North Coast resident, um, volunteer for our forest, coast, and ocean. Thank you. Uh, Ali Berman? Yeah, hi, Ali Berman. I'm the communications manager for Portland Audubon, and I also do macro, uh, phot macro photography in the intertidal zone all up and down the coast. So I'm here for birds and nudibranchs and everybody in between. Thank you. Kent. Hi, I'm Kent Doty, and I'm just here to listen today. Thank you. And Charlie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Charlie Plyvin, uh, Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. I also sit on the Ocean Policy Advisory Council, winding down my term. I think it's my last year here. Uh, and also was part of the Rocky Habitat Working Group for OPAC. Thank you. Is there anybody I missed? All righty. Well, thank you everyone again for being here today for this workshop. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, before we move any further, I would just like to say a few words um, about our conversation today and provide some ground rules. Uh, it's really important to have a respectful conversation as we proceed today. Uh, that is really gonna take some active listening uh, and please refrain from any personal attacks. And part of that is that we really wanna understand people's motivations and perspectives. Uh, and that really kind of begins with don't stating, or please do not state an opinion without also helping us understand the why behind that, the causation behind that. Uh, and during our discussion today, uh, which will be after the presentations, uh, we will convene our, our panelists to, to discuss uh, our, the topics in front of us. And it will be very helpful for everyone following our conversation if we can have our panelists uh, where possible leave their cameras on, uh, especially when speaking, that will help us all to follow our, our conversation. So uh, without further ado, I would like to allow folks to provide public comment. I do have uh, Nadia Gardner uh, listed first with the chat, but uh, for other folks who would like to provide public comment, go ahead and uh, provide a, an indication to me in the chat and we will get you in the order that I receive those. So Nadia, please proceed. And if you could, for the record, uh, I got your name, an organization, but let's let's do that one more time if you're providing oral testimony today. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Nadia Gardner. I'm representing myself today, though I certainly have lots of coastal hats. Um, so I just am um, here to talk a little bit about my perspective on the two Rocky Habitat site des designations. Um, I moved to Cannon Beach just south, <clears throat> south of these sites at the north end. Um, south of Ocola State Park and south of Tillamook Head uh, 20 years ago. I now live in Arch Cape, but have a lot of knowledge of an affinity, aff aff affinity for um, that North End space, which is really an incredible place for those people who have visited it before. I'm gonna ask that, um, that uh, the Oregon Policy, uh, the Ocean Policy Advisory Council approve the sites at Chapman Point and Acola Point as marine education area and a marine conservation area designation, respectively. Um, this stretch of rocky habitat is a major tourist destination for travelers on the North Coast. The biggest day in Cannon Beach is 30,000 people. As uh, Kelly Innes at HRAP knows well, um, this is a place that um, people from all over Oregon and um, uh, as well as throughout the nation and around the world really encounter Oregon's ocean, some of them for the first time. It brings, um, the tourism brings vital revenue to our community. Um, but one of the big issues our community faces is overloving of some of our wildlife areas. 
through the marine conservation area and marine education area designations like Haystack Rock, we can try to preserve these amazing places for current and future generations to enjoy. Chapman Point is loved by residents, serving as a stunning place for our neighbors to walk, watch sunsets, take their children and grandchildren, and view wildlife. And it includes an incredibly large common mirror nesting colony and several nesting sites for black oyster catcher. The tide pools are home to diverse wildlife, including sea stars, anemones, mussels, sh shore crabs, and countless other animals. The Cola Point is more remote. It's an otherworldly treasure of dramatic rock formations and extensive tide pools, much more than Chapman Point. Lots and lots of sea, sea stars, which you don't see as much of as anymore. It also has impressive breeding colonies of seabirds, including eight of high importance, according to US Fish and Wildlife Service. Sea Lion Rock at Acola Point was formal, formerly one of the three largest haul-out sites on the North Oregon coast for stellar sea lions. Um, however, um, other threatened and endangered species also use the site, and um, those include brown pelicans and others. We're really concerned as residents of the North Coast about um, recent uh, failures of black oyster, oyster catcher nests as well as increases in pedestrians, dogs off leash, drones, um, and fireworks. Um, when I was reading the materials for this meeting, I was really concerned that in some of the workshops, there was discussion that current regulations already protect wildlife. So why give them any new protections? The regulations that are in place are not sufficient. We're seeing that every day. Um, these sites are particularly important and vulnerable and they need special protection. So that's why I support these new rocky habitat designations at both sites with management changes within the designated areas that reduce disturbances to nesting birds and bird mortality with education and management measures. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, the next person is Tabia Goosen, followed by Kristen Bayans. Um, <clears throat> yes, just briefly, uh, Robin Risley with the city, the Cannon Beach City Council wasn't able to attend this hearing, and I have her permission to relay her support of these two uh, proposals. Great, thank you very much. Um, Kristen. Yes, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good, great. So I'm going to read a statement. The North Coast Land Conservancy supports the Marine Education Area designation for Chapman Point and the Marine Conservation Area designation for Acola Point, both north of Cannon Beach, Oregon. These two locations are home to nesting seabirds and scores of invertebrates and several mammals. In, in addition, Chapman Point and Acola Point experience heavy and consistent visitorship. As a result, the rocky shores are degrading and their bio in, biodiverse inhabitants suffer. Through the degradations of marine education area and marine conservation area, these ecologically important areas can be preserved and interpretive programs by dedicated volunteers can be put in place to educate visitors on safe and respectful recreation. Furthermore, providing special designations for these shared natural resources aids in the lessening the gap of habitat connectivity, which creates more secure wildlife corridors on the North Oregon coast by joining sister sites of Haystack Rock Marine Garden Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge and Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. The sites are within North Coast Land Conservancy service area and the organization is prepared to assist with the Marine Program Coordinator staff time, volunteer recruitment and other avenues once designation for these wonderful sites is established. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kristen. And uh, just a quick note, if if folks are not speaking, can you please mute your microphones? We've we've got a, a good number of folks on today, so let's try and eliminate any background noise. Um, the next person is Kelly, uh, followed by uh, Jason. All right. My name is Kelly Ennis, and I'm the director of the Haystack Rock Awareness Program, or HRAP. We've been a program of the city of Cannon Beach since 1985. Uh, I want to first say thank you for this opportunity to comment on the conservation proposals for Chapman Point and E. Cola Point. I really appreciate all the work that all of you do and for listening to the public's opinion on this. Uh, at HREP, we educate guests about the tide pool and bird ecology at Haystack Rock Marine Garden. We are currently in our 37th year of sharing this natural wonder, wonder with visitors 
both uh, local and tourists. And we have seen firsthand the positive impact that these designations can have for wildlife and the humans that congregate into the shared natural space of ours. So as such, I would like to state HRAP's support of the proposals for Ecola Point as a marine conservation area and Chapman Point as a marine education area. While we here at ATRAP keep our scope to just the one marine garden, it has always been part of our vision to see other organizations and local enthusiasts take ownership over their own natural wonders. And one of the, our goals is for environmental stewardship that we see at Haystack Rock to spread to other region, regional sites of ecological importance. Ecola Point and Chapman Point are both important and complex ecological sites that house extensive tide pools, large breeding colonies of seabirds, and nesting sites for various sensitive shorebirds. Chapman Point in particular is an accessible area that is growing in popularity, in part due to the thriving biodiversity seen there and its close vicinity to Cannon Beach. HREP began as a volunteer program initiated by a very small group of concerned and passionate citizens before it was adopted into the city of Cannon Beach. And this is exactly what I see happening at Chapman Point. It's a small group of enthusiastic professionals and locals who are working tirelessly to do exactly what was done for Haystack Rock nearly 40 years ago. And it's something that I really strongly support and love to see. We state our values at ATRAP as education, stewardship, collaboration, and community. And I believe that all of these are highly espoused by an MEA and a local education group for Chapman Point and an MCA at Ocola Point. We have stated before and will emphasize again our readiness to support any volunteer or nonprofit education program with equipment, supply sharing, volunteer training, signage, event coordination, storage space, media outreach, and collaborative grant writing. Through these designations for Chapman Point and Aquila Point, I believe that the wildlife and ecology that lives, breeds, and thrives will continue to flourish for all people to share and enjoy and to learn how to appreciate for our current generations and those that have yet to come. Here at ATREP, we strongly, believe, we strongly support these designations, which will help accomplish our goals and strengthen our community at large. Thank you very much. Uh, Jason Shemmerhorn, followed by Angela Whitlock. I just wanted to uh, reiterate that I did speak with uh, Fire Chief Reckman, and he was sorry he wasn't able to be here, but we do both uh, support the designation and we both actually uh, work in these areas and see the detriment uh, to the areas um, by different folks that come through and uh, desecrate the areas by walking and hiking through there in undesignated areas. And so we support this designation and enforcement of it. Thank you. Angela. Hi there. <clears throat> My name is Angela Whitlock and I'm a resident of Seaside, Oregon and have lived on the North Coast for the past 22 years. Thank you for giving me a few moments of your time this afternoon to voice my support of the protection proposals for both Chapman and Ecola points. I am a marine educator and I work for both the Haystack Rock Awareness Program in Cannon Beach and the Tide Pool Ambassador Program at Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. I spend hundreds of hours each year on the beach interacting with visitors and promoting environmental stewardship. I've also volunteered time at Chapman Point and Ecola Point monitoring, monitoring black oyster catcher nests and I'm eager to spend more time doing so again this season with other volunteer stewards of the North Coast Rocky Habitat Coalition. I am very concerned with what I see happening to our rocky habitats, especially recently. There is no doubt that the population and visitation to our area has dramatically increased and continues to do so. This is now our new normal. Increased visitation means increased foot traffic and trampling in the delicate intertidal ecosystems where so many unique creatures make their home. Scientific studies based in Oregon have shown that tide pools are not as resilient as they once were due to many environmental factors. These factors plus added pressure from human presence mean that these beloved areas are struggling to survive. They are literally being loved to death. Most intertidal explorers don't realize that the boulders they climb on to get the perfect Instagram photo are covered with living anemone, barnacles, mussels, and shore crab. They aren't aware that the pools they wade through have nudibranchs, snails, and sculpin underfoot. Without tide pool education, they don't understand what a black oyster catcher is, 
and that allowing their off-leash dog to run around in their nesting area is detrimental to the species of conservation concern. There are also those who realize their harmful impact in the habitat, but simply don't care. I've seen people make a game of harassing birds and other wildlife with drones, and people who excite and encourage their dogs to chase shorebirds. I have witnessed hermit crabs being whacked with a baseball bat for batting practice, and sea stars being pried off of rocks just for the entertainment of it. Both Chapman, and Nicole, Chapman Point and Ecola Point are shining examples of the amazing biodiversity that can be found in intertidal environments. Because of their beauty, many articles have been written about these areas, which has driven interest and increased pressure. Social media has also played a big role in driving new traffic to these areas. We concern locals and beach enthusiasts know the value of these areas and believe that we are at a critical point right now. With these proposed designations, we have an amazing opportunity to mitigate future damage and site degradation to these pristine places. We want to be able to continue to monitor the beloved black oyster catcher nests and watch new chicks fledge each year. We want to continue to monitor seabird colonies that make their summer home on bird rocks. We want to always marvel at the richly abundant, brightly colored tide pools that serve as a gateway between Crescent and Indian beaches. And most importantly, we want to involve the future generations in our activities so that we may pass the legacy on for their enjoyment. I'm asking you to please approve both site designations this coming fall. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, Angela. Is there anybody else that would like to provide public comment? I would. Sure, go ahead, please uh, state your name and uh, if you have an affiliation. I'm Bob Atia, I live in Cannon Beach. Um, I've been visiting the North Oregon coast since the 1950s. Um, I read an article yesterday that said, Oregon's intertidal ecosystem is approaching a tipping point. And it talked about a group of researchers that have been um, studying the intertidal zone for the last decade. And they're discovering that it's not as resilient as they think it is. And it seems to really be declining and they're worried about it reaching a tipping point. And once it does that, there's no going back. It's irreversible. Um, you look out at the ocean and it appears to be infinite and eternal and unchanging, um, but there's a lot of stuff going on out there and none of it's good. Um, the warm blob, the dead zone, demoic acid, CSAR wasting disease, microplastics, the ocean's warming and acidifying, oxygen levels are declining, oceanic food chains unraveling, seabird populations are declining, sometimes dramatically. Um, I started walking around Chapman and Nicole Points about 20 years ago. And back then you'd see very few folks out there. Um, the last couple of years, I mean, it's not unusual to see more than 100 people out there and, and a lot of dogs and people wading through tide pools and people walking through there with five gallon buckets harvesting mussels, I assume. I'm not sure, but um, there's a lot more people than there used to be and there's a lot more human impacts. Um, so even to the casual observer, things are changing. Um, population of seabirds is declining. Um, there's not as many animals in the tide pools. That's just obvious to anyone who's been going out there for a while. These areas are already under enormous amount of stress just from environmental conditions and protecting these two areas, Chapman Point and Ecola Point is one thing we can do to at least try to mitigate some of the human impacts to these areas. So uh, I'm in favor of protecting both these areas. So thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to provide comment at this time? Um, Charlie Plyburn. Hey, um, Charlie Plyburn, Oregon Policy Manager and uh, OPAC member. I just wanted to call like as a, a point of process and maybe for, for those um, um, advocating for this proposal and around this proposal that I kept hearing a, a, a very distinct difference uh, in a recommendation for a designation than what was proposed. 
and evaluated by the working group and by the Ocean Policy Advisory Council. Um, distinctly, I kept hearing education area for Chapman Point, which was not the designation that was evaluated. So um, as a point of process, Andy, I think it's gonna be extremely important for us OPAC members that do do outreach to our constituents um, to be able to clearly uh, distinguish the difference between the proposal that we were looking at um, last year uh, and evaluating last year and that that may be in front of us today, which I'm excited to learn more about. Um, but I know that not all of our OPAC members uh, are paying attention to these uh, these Rocky Habitat meetings. So I just wanted to call attention to that and say that I think that's going to be really important um, for us at OPAC. OPAC is going to need some time to talk to their constituents, particularly for things that have changed substantially. Yes, thank you, Charlie. Um, to respond to that directly, that that is one of the goals of the, the further evaluation process is for, for OPAC themselves to hear about each of these proposals in their own venue uh, with an opportunity to ask questions and learn more about them prior to making a decision this fall. Um, and as, as a part of this process, you know, we have allowed modifications that respond to some of the considerations that were identified through the original evaluation. And that is, that is the goal of uh, this effort is to uh, allow our proposal teams to hear from our agencies to uh, respond to those uh, comments if that's what they believe. And, and then to allow the Ocean Policy Advisory Council to uh, to learn about that and to then make a decision later this fall. Uh, so thank you for, for putting that, that point of order. Uh, this was a, a marine conservation area proposal originally, and part of the discussion today will be centered around how this group has potentially changed their thinking and uh, been uh, supportive of modifications to that original idea. So, uh, is there, is there anybody else who would like to provide a public comment before we move into our uh, presentation by the proposal team? Uh, Joe, leave us out. Yeah, just, I mean, I guess in response to Charlie a little bit, I think, I, try, I know Charlie knows this, but just so everyone else is clear is that the, um, even though not all OPAC members could be here today, the um, the decision will not be made by OPAC today, it will be made in the fall meeting, so there's several months, and then also the proposers will get the chance to talk directly to OPAC at the upcoming June meeting, I think, uh, right, Andy? So there is quite a bit of time for OPAC members to educate themselves on this, and we'll have a direct presentation available to them at the June meeting, so I just want to clear, just make that clear to everybody. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, well, we are now at the point in our agenda where I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, we will make Jesse a co-host and then allow you to share your screen. Looks like the host has disabled my screen. Yeah, go ahead and try now. Okay. Looks good. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jesse Jones, and I am the volunteer coordinator for Coast Watch. As I said before, um, I am authorized to speak on behalf of Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition, who do support these um, these designations. And um, as I also said before, I was not the original leader of this group. I stepped in um, in the summer, this last summer, um, to continue uh, leading and guiding this group through the further evaluations. Today with some of the members of the North Coast Rocky Habitat Coalition, as they have been calling themselves for a couple of years now, um, I will be presenting together uh, about the Cola Point and Chapman Point. Um, and here with me to co-present on some of the slides are three residents of Cannon Beach who introduced themselves earlier, uh, Mickey Moritz, Debatia, and Tabea Goosen. 
um, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, attend this workshop and, and, and that DLCD offered this discussion today. Um, the presentation today will focus on the topics that DLCD staff specified should be covered, um, namely the considerations outlined in the initial recommendation summaries and the coalition's responses from 2021, which have been modified. But first, we will broadly cover the proposed intentions at these sites. Um, so here is a map of the two proposed site areas. As you can see, they are quite close to one another, about a third of a mile. And note the location of a Cola Point parking lot. This is the main parking lot at a Cola State Park that overlooks a Cola Point and the city of Cannon Beach. Please note that this shows the north end of the city of Cannon Beach. The main tourist area and beach are further south, not shown in this image. Located at the northern end of the city of Cannon Beach, the rocky habitat at Chapman Point boasts, boasts breathtaking views, magnificent rock formations, and tide pools full of life, as you heard from the many uh, testifiers here today. Chapman Point is loved by residents, serving as a stunning place for community members, visitors to walk, watch sunsets, take their children and grandchildren, and view wildlife. It is located just 1.7 miles north of Haystack Rock, one of the most iconic locations on the Oregon coast, and home to a breeding colony of tufted puffins. The stretch of rocky habitat includes some of the most visited on the coast, putting it at high risk of habitat degradation. And next, uh, to talk about uh, visitor usage and share uh, growing concerns about visitation um, is uh, a member of the group, Mickey Moritz. Oh, you're muted, Mickey. There we go. I think much of what I say has been said even better by some of our public comment, but I will run through some points you've already heard from the public. Uh, first of all, we should note that tourism traffic at Chapman Point has increased significantly since the Rocky Shores Management Plan was written in 1994. As you heard, many of us have noticed the higher visitor usage over time, and that visitation has grown exponentially in the last couple of years in part due to the pandemic and visitors looking for less crowded options. Just to name a few of the ways in which this area is being promoted very widely. Um, for instance, Cannon Beach Chamber of Commerce directs people to Chapman and Crescent Beaches. Uh, there's at least one local business that directs its um, visitors to park outside of Ecola State Park and then hike into Crescent Beach. Furthermore, there are many travel sites, blogs, articles, and a book highlighting the undiscovered beaches at Chapman and Crescent Beach. Finally, as we all know, Oregon State Parks has had a record number of visitors last year, and especially to the coastal parks. These, these areas are perceived to have fewer restrictions than Haystack Rock and less enforcement, and that sometimes increases the attraction as well. Taken the, together, the visitation to the proposed sites at Chapman Point and Ecola Point has already expanded to such an extent that there's no longer a question of drawing undue attention to these locations. They are firmly on the map and well known. Sadly, the current visitor levels have begun to impact wildlife. As you heard earlier, some of the human caused disturbances include disrupting bird nests through climbing on rocks, the drones flushing wildlife, visitors trampling tribe pools, fireworks disrupting the seabirds and black oyster catcher nests and off-leash dogs, certainly disturbing and distressing nesting birds, chasing, killing, and maiming birds. In particular, also mentioned earlier, there has been a recent high failure rate of black oyster catcher nests. In 2020, six of black oyster catcher, catcher nests with potentially 14 chicks from Chapman Point to Ecola Point only one nest survived, fledging two chicks. Other bird species that used to be here are either decreasing or gone. Also, as mentioned earlier, a recent peer-reviewed study from the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, that's MINGI 2022, documented the decreased resistance of Oregon's intertidal ecosystems to disturbance. And this finding highlights how important it is to start addressing human disturbance right now before it's too late. Certainly, all signs point to the fact that visitation to these areas will only continue to increase 
And it's time to think about how we sustainably protect these ecosystems. That protection begins with a habitat designation. Back to you, Jesse. Thank you, Mickey. So located just north of Chapman Point and adjacent to Ecola State Park, Ecola Point and Sea Lion Rock are an otherworldly treasure of dramatic rock formations and extensive tide pools with healthy mus muscle beds and rebounding population of sea stars. This area is also a crucial haul out site for seals and sea lions and a home for nesting shorebirds and seabirds. Ecola Point was identified in the 1994 Rocky Shores Management Plan as an area with complex mixture of resources and high usage, needing, quote, more detailed study and assessment before designation into a management category. Similarly, Sea Lion Rock, right offshore of Ecola Point, was designated as a priority rock for possible study and future management measures. However, no management measures have been enacted since then. This complex has impressive breeding colonies of seabirds, including eight of high importance, according to the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Sea Lion Rock at Ecola Point site was formerly one of the three largest haul out sites on the North Oregon coast for stellar sea lions, which someone actually mentioned earlier today, but it's now been abandoned for unknown reasons. A former rhinoceros auklet ne nesting colony site since disappeared 2005, but was well documented for decades before then. Other threatened or endangered species use this site, including harbor seals, bald eagles, and brown pelicans. Next, uh, Tabea Goosen will share about concerns about growing visitation at Chapman Point in regards to rocky wildlife, ha rocky habitat wildlife, and I think actually Ecola Point as well. Ecola Point, yes, sorry, go ahead. Um, my internet is misbehaving, so if I lose you, I'll let you continue on. <clears throat> um, we've, you know, issues at E. coli are pretty much the same as Chapman Point. Uh, according to locals and frequent visitors, foot traffic at E. coli has increased significantly since 1994. And data gathered by a volunteer bird monitor and experienced birders show that challenges facing the inhabitants of the rocky shores are growing. In June of 2020, as I approached the black oyster catcher nest to do a survey, I heard the parent frantically alarm calling. Just as I arrived at the nest site, a dog owner intentionally unleashed his, his dog to chase that annoying yappy bird. The dog chased up the rock to the nest, then followed the frantic parent off the rock. The dog owner ultimately leashed his dog, but had I not been there, the nest and the parent would have been destroyed. This event was lightning quick, as are all dog events. Like kill deer and snowy plover, oyster catcher chicks are on the beach before they can fly. The chicks don't stand a chance with the volume of dogs on the beach. The wildlife has to deal with wild predators and adding the burden of human and, and dog predation makes it difficult for them to survive. Surprisingly, when I saw that same dog owner on following days, his dog was leashed. Human caused disturbances at E. coli are similar to those at Chapman Point. Um, you know, as we talked about with Chapman, we have trampling in the intertidal zone, climbing on the rocks where birds breed, walking on sand too near the nesting sites, and disturbing marine mammals as well as low flying aircraft and drones. There's also some fish and vertebrate and algae harvest, but the data to quantify that isn't available. So we just have anecdotal observations to cite. As with Chapman, we have high visitor usage at E. coli. In 2016, per OPRD parking lot count, we had 356,000 visitors and the trend is increasing. During COVID, wow, it was intense. And Ecola Park just recently opened up again after being closed most of last year. This opening has been celebrated by state parks and its social media. As you can see here, the secret is out. Photographers, hikers, and surfers rejoice. E. coli point and Indian beach are back, baby.
Thank you, Tabea. So the goals of these proposals are to preserve and strengthen the ecological integrity of the sites, including existing marine life, fish, seabird and shorebird nesting areas that exist in these rocky habitats for long-term sustainability, to preserve E. coli points what wilderness character and relatively low visitation in the face of increasing tourism and population, population on the North Coast, to provide an opportunity for public outreach and education at Chapman Point to help achieve the first goal and to educate members of the public that are walking north toward Ecola Point. The intention behind these goals to prepare for the future. These places are relatively pristine now with the exception of the wildlife losses already noted at Ecola Point and Chapman Point. We would like to preserve these strong ecosystems to pr provide resilient places to sustain wildlife as we head into the future with climate change. These areas will support healthy fish populations and other ecosystem services we all rely on while providing beautiful places for people to recreate and experience nature. The proposals are meant to shape long-term efforts and goals to improve site management. So now we'll go through the implementation considerations bulleted in the initial recommendations and the final recommendation summaries from the agencies, including several clarifications. The agency stated that there should be no additional restrictions on climbing and walking on intertidal rocks and offshore rocks. And we understand the working group's pushback on this, which is based on maintaining north-south access along the coast is protected by the beach bill and not being in line with uh, TSP3 objectives to balance, to balance site use and access with ecological protection. Several points on this. These points are very dynamic environments, but there is typically north-south access on sand through both of these areas at low tides. At high tides, they are unable to pass, un or unsafe to pass and unable to pass. Due to, the, due to the geography of the Chapman Point site, most rocky intertidal areas there are typically accessible from the sand. During low tides, large portions of the rocky intertidal at E. coli Point are typically accessible by walking on sand due to sand accumulation. While the sand shifts every day. Um, let's see. Sorry, while the sand shifts every year, sand paths typically provide access to a number of large muscle beds and allow for north-south access through the area. Regarding balancing site use, the coalition asks the agencies to consider their view of what balanced site use is. And this was asked last year by Margaret Treadwell. Is it truly a balance to allow unimpeded site access everywhere? A goal of the Rocky Habitat Management Strategy is long-term stewardship and conservation of natural resources by lessening the potential ecological impacts of recreation. If limiting access to the rocky intertidal in some areas to prevent trampling is not the right solution, what is? We would like to work with agencies to figure this out. Therefore, after discussions and support from nearby conservation neighbors, the group is changing the Chapman designation ask from Marine Conservation Area to Marine Education Area. And we will talk about that today. A goal of the Rocky Habitat Management Strategy is long-term stewardship and conservation of natural resources by lessening the potential ecological impacts of recreation. Since the agencies are against limiting access to the Rocky Intertidal in some areas to prevent trampling, our proposed solution is more education at Chapman Point in the form of, it, of a marine education area, also known as a marine garden. Uh, and these, this is supported by, and you heard from some of them today, uh, Haystack Rock Awareness Program. It's also supported by Oregon Shores Conservation Co uh, Coalition. Um, and as you heard also, North Coast Land Conservancy's Marine Program at Cape Falcon. And I believe there were also letters received uh, from the, uh, an additional letter from the Friends of Haystack Rock Awareness Program also supporting um, both of these designations. So next, Debatia will present the group's responses to the considerations of fireworks and then dogs. And Deb, you're on mute. Okay. Thank you to all of you for um, your considerations in this 
place. Um, again, I was a uh, uh, part of the North Coast Rocky Habitat and also was out on the beach monitoring the black oyster catchers last summer. And um, been a native, Ore I'm a native Oregonian and have been coming here all my life and I now live here. And um, so basically fireworks mm -hmm. in um, July, 2020, we had the worst uh, Independence Day weekend in eight years. And so fireworks, the implement, implementation considerations um, on this say, no, we're not adding any additional restrictions on fireworks and other wildlife disturbance because um, it has been removed from the proposal and new rules have been implemented. Because in September of 2020, the city council in Canada Beach voted unanimously after that uh, high incident um, month of fireworks to ban all fireworks within the city of Cannon Beach. Fireworks are also strictly prohibited on the beach as well. So there was an educational outreach that took place the first half, uh, first, well, from that point, an educational outreach, educating the public about the ban um, that fireworks endangers the sea life and disturbs, disturbs wildlife, and that haystack rocks uh, and rocks at Chapman Point are part of the Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge and a state protected marine environment. Chapman and Ecola Point are also a concern as people set off illegal fireworks at Crescent Beach um, and to enforce the ban during the 4th of July, um, police chief, our Cannon Beach chief, police chief, um, all the officers were on the duty and we had an amazing team. The fire department um, was on duty. Oregon State Parks participated. Justin Parker um, helped. And US Welsh Fish and Wildlife, Clatsop County Sheriff Department and local CERT teams, we all monitored and we had a successful um, no fireworks 4th of July in 2021. So it worked. Um, now, the next... Uh, slide is with the plan to approach the dog and people pet and wildlife safety and the implement implementation considerations state no additional restrictions of off-leash dogs. Our modified response um, considering the change to the MEA at Chapman Point an educational program where volunteers can approach dog order owners who are um, off-leash and remind them um, of the state park rules are already in place, like near Haystack Rock Education Program. We'll mitigate dogs chasing birds and trampling tide pools is the hope. Um, disturbance and injury to birds, marine mammals, and other wildlife and people off leash and people by off leash dogs has frequently been observed at this site, including killing and maiming birds. We are at the point where the human population and the corresponding dog population have reached a level that there are enough poorly behaving dog owners and dogs to make a real impact on nesting birds and young chicks at these sites. A local volunteer said she worked at the Wildlife Center and it was understood that dog injuries and deaths came from Cannon Beach. Um, Cannon Beach is a very dog friendly environment. This problem will only worsen as visitation increases. To remind the agencies, the proposal tried to balance the uses by keeping Crescent Beach, which is between Ecola and Chapman Points, open to dogs. The main reason that we submitted two site proposals rather than one was so that we could carve out that area for off-leash dogs. Incidents are rarely reported because of lack of knowledge or where or how to report it. People don't want to address conflict and seek quick resolution. The incidents happen quickly before the injured person realizes there is a problem. Um, now the Cannon Beach Police Chief and I are working on educational outreach on dog safety. A flyer will be on the city uh, Cannon Beach page and soon will be out in social media like we did with fireworks and other all, all other media outlets, hopefully just as successful. The key is marketing and education. Um, we love dogs in Cannon Beach and we want to keep sea life, wildlife and dogs and people safe. So we hope that this will mitigate issues at Chapman Point as well as see it as opportunity for sy synergy with the city to reduce rescue incidents through education.
Thank you, Deb. So um, to clarify uh, to the agencies today, um, this uh, the the implement, implementation consider considerations for fireworks is now moot because a law has been passed, and um, the modified response for off-leash dogs is uh, in the discussion today. We would like to clarify. Um, with OPRD if the boundary at Ecola goes to the waterline, and then considering the change at Chapman Point, um, we would like to use education uh, to um, discuss rules with uh, people with dogs taking their dogs uh, from the south to the north. Um, so a couple more items. Clarification on the access maintenance improvements in our proposal for Ecola Point. We were not intending to restrict maintenance and improvement of the Crescent Beach Trail, the Indian Beach Trail, nor the network of trails atop the headland adjacent to the main southern Ecola State parking lot that leads to the scenic overlooks. The trails for which we were proposing to restrict maintenance and improvement are the unsafe private trails from the Ecola State Park parking lot on top of the headland that go down to the nearly vertical face of the headland, of, of the headland directly to Ecola Point. Our understanding of is that these trails are already decommissioned and not maintained. So we are simply recommending maintaining the status quo as we understand it and that no new trails following these approximate routes are created in the future. In our Chapman Point proposal, um, we do not propose any restrictions on access maintenance improvements. Regarding the buffers, oops, sorry. Go back a slide here. Regarding the buffers for boats, airplanes, drones, and kites, a clarification, our proposed buffers apply only to recreational vehicles. We understand the agency's concerns, but would like to retrain the re retain the restriction on motorized recreational vessels to reduce disturbance to nesting seabirds and hauled out marine mammals. We reached out to the charter boat community in Garibaldi to check our site boundaries and the Dungeness Crab Commission to alter our boundaries to remove areas that are used by crabbers. Um, we want to continue to work with these communities, the fishing and crab communities, for solutions that work for everyone. Regarding buffers for airplanes, drones, and kites, uh, we understand the agency's position and are amenable to removing these, but we ask the agencies to recommend to OPAC um, an awareness campaign about existing rules. And also I can state that drone rules are currently being developed now on the Oregon coast. Uh, lastly, we are, the group is amenable to removing restrictions on subtitled invertebrate harvest at a cola point that will change uh, now with the um, proposed new designation of a marine education area at Chapman point. And we propose to add a goal to our proposal to monitor human activity in the subtitle for any potential disturbance impacts at, uh, at a cola point. Um, and regarding reconciliation of boundaries with respects to the statutory vegetation line, we defer to the state on this and are amenable to this change. So thank you for this opportunity um, to present on behalf of this group. And as this group has said before, the goal was to present the issues that they see currently and get ahead of increasing visitation at these sites by protecting them now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse and panelists. I'd like to allow our, our agency panelists now to ask any clarifying questions. Dave, Sorry, looks, there you I'm go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Without the uh, official reaction. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of questions about kind of the changes in regulations to get to a little more precision on exactly what they are, you know, what, what's being kind of expected and proposed at this point. But I'm wondering that that might be better talked about as we get into the discussion rather than to try to ask a bunch of questions right now. Sure, thanks, Dave. I, I think that that sounds good if, if we think we can kind of direct that during the 
yeah. the, the meat of our discussion. I do have a clarifying question on the additional drone restrictions and, and the development of rules on the coast. I was just hoping you might expand on that process for everyone's knowledge benefit. I would like to defer that question to Joe, who has been um, kind of involved in that, if that's okay, Joe, if you feel comfortable talking about that. Sure, and I could also defer to folks at Oregon State Parks as well, but it's, okay, um, because of the state, the bill that passed um, a couple of legislative sessions ago, there's a process now going on where there's being rules developed for drone usage in um, state parks and also ocean shoreline that OPRD administers. And um, the, uh, the right now in the draft rules, um, any rocky habitat designation would be uh, there would not be any drone takeoff and landings in um, uh, any rocky habitat designation. Um, that doesn't include airspace, which is regulated by FAA, of course, but um, it, that process is still ongoing. And uh, so it's unclear if that will come to fruition, but that is right now in the draft uh, rule. Thank you. I think that's that's helpful for everyone to know. Okay, well, and Dave, just, go ahead. If I can, a quick clarifying question. Yep. Um, I was wondering about the, and this is kind of curiosity on my part, the firework ban in Cannon Beach and how if it's a city regulation that could be applied to a beach that's, as far as I know, isn't really in the city. Laurel simple. has her hand up. Um, fireworks are already not allowed on the beach, which is why we, made that point and the original proposal was that we didn't think there needed to be an additional rule when it was already a ban so it wasn't that we disagreed with it it's already the case okay okay that, that answers it thanks are there any other clarifying questions Okay, well, I'm gonna um, go ahead and take our afternoon break here. Um, why don't we return at um, 1.50. Thanks everyone. We will reconvene at 1.50.
Alrighty, so as you come back, please uh, turn your video on or give me a thumbs up in the chat to let me know that you're back and ready to go. Well, I think we, most of us are back here. So why don't we go ahead and begin? Uh, the next component of our discussion today is really uh, to begin to discuss the issues associated with uh, what Jesse and her team laid out nicely as the considerations, which resulted from the evaluation of the original uh, site proposals. And the way that I would like to do this is to uh, first just remind everybody that this will be a, a, a panel discussion between the proposers of the, the two uh, sites, uh, Chapman and Nicola Point, as well as the agencies uh, who are on the line. Um, there will be an additional public comment opportunity uh, following our discussion uh, for those of you who are not in that category and are just listening in. Um, we do have at our uh, disposal the uh, informational materials that were present in the original uh, proposals. We have the, the recommendations and the response, as well as uh, the, the final working group recommendations, uh, both for uh, Chapman and Nicola. We also have the, the C sketch tool that, that we can use to look at specific uh, issues on a map if need be. Um, and I will be facilitating our discussion uh, this afternoon. I do have a couple of slides with the bullets on them, uh, which our proposers uh, did a good job of, of including in their presentation. So um, I'll just have them up here for the moment. But uh, what I'd like to do, since I know that uh, Dave has some questions, is I'm actually going to uh, stop sharing my screen so that I can see you all uh, together and uh, initiate the discussion. Uh, Moses, if I could help you, um, or have you help me keep track of hands that are raised? Um, we have a lot of panelists this afternoon, and I may not catch that entirely. So uh, if you okay. could just back me up on that. Um, and uh, Dave, uh, since you let us know that you had a, a number of questions, why don't I let you go first? Sure, Thank, thanks, Andy. So, so my questions are most around, um, you know, the areas uh, of, of regulatory change are within ODF and W jurisdiction. So it's gonna be the, the fish and, and invertebrate, um, <clears throat> excuse me, harvest regulations. Um, and I'll separate, I have a question or two for Chapman Point and a couple of questions for ECOA. So I'll, I'll keep those, try to keep those separate. Um, so Chapman, um, with the revised proposal to a, a marine education area or, or marine garden, um, we would um, basically apply our standard regulation for marine gardens, um, <clears throat> which is no harvest of invertebrates um, and that it has that tiny exception, except single mussels for, for bait. Um, so that if, if it, if it does, you know, come through as that, as that designation, that's, that's what we're going to apply. Um, the question I have is, um, was the intention for that to apply to just the intertidal area or intertidal plus the subtitle areas, um, of, of the proposed area? Mm -hmm. And let the panel answer that. 
My understanding is that it is the inner title and subtitle. And okay. if anyone else um, in our group disagrees with that, with, with me, um, um, I didn't get that uh, right Jesse, from all of you. Jesse, I think we are just defaulting to the MEA, which um, and I think we are, uh, um, yeah. as uh, w w the way we responded last year was that we would remove the subtitle considerations and just keep the inner title. Okay, okay. thanks, okay. Joe. All right, thanks. Um, and then um, uh, another question is the buffers, um, mo mostly about the vessel buffer around the rocks. Is that, was that just for the rocks off E. coli? Or did that, that, or did that buffer proposal also include the rocks off Chapman? Um, I'd have to look at the map, but I think that that includes the rocks off of Chapman, but it's a smaller area. Do you want me to pull that map back up? Just I, I think we, since we're defaulting to an MEA again, I think we're going with the the default where would, that would not be included. Uh, Okay. And we're sticking with okay. the um, the buffer in the MCA. Okay. And Thank you, Joe. Well, that 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 answers the questions I had for Chapman. Then, um, for Ecola. So, as I understand it, you would be proposing. Um, sorry, my handwriting is not too good on my notes. Um, proposing no harvest of marine invertebrates in the inner tidal. Is that is that correct? Are you asking about Ecola now? Yeah, now I'm on Ecola. Yeah, sorry. Um, actually, in the responses from 2021, the group was amenable to um, harvest restrict to no harvest restrictions, and that was in 2021. Oh, no harvest restrictions. Okay. So that so one, and that has not changed at Ecola. Okay. So there wouldn't be any invertebrate harvest restrictions? No. In, in the subtitle or inner title, or was that for both? Subtitle okay. and inner title. OK. And is the same true for fish, like for people fishing? Yes. OK. From the shore, yes. Yeah, OK. Sorry, I'm just writing down a note here. Um, so the vessel buffer um, around the rocks. Um, so that would be actually an Oregon State Marine Board regulation. So it's kind of outside, it's outside the jurisdiction of any of the agencies that are here at today's meeting. Um, but, you know, I, I will say a few things about that, but I don't want to like speak for Oregon State Marine Board. So it's just kind of my own thoughts on it. Um, there, there may be some, some difficulty in enforcement if it's like for for sport boats only um in most cases you know someone that needed to enforce it could tell the difference between a sport and a commercial boat but there are there are a few cases like dory type boats things like that where the where the sport and commercial boats look almost exactly the same um, so there may be some enforcement issues but I, I would have to let state marine board you know talk about that if that's actually an issue or, or not just wanted to, to bring it up um, the Dave? other yeah. Uh, on that point, I actually spoke with um, Josh from the Marine Board this morning and had okay. a conversation with him about uh, the potential of a, a buffer for boating. Um, one of his questions back to me was, what is the understanding of the, the current um, actually frequency of a boat entering into 500 feet distance from the Rock City Cola Point. Um, he, he did not know the answer to that. He said that he reached out to uh, the Clatsop County Sheriff's Office and um, they didn't have a good understanding of that either, but the anecdotal comment was, why would anyone go that close to shore? You'd risk sinking your boat. Um, so I, I think that there's uh, a lack of data to inform how frequently uh, this, if it were to be put in place, uh, what it would take to enforce and and, and the, the true need for that. Um, so 
that was that was his comment. I think he he said that if he if it were to move forward, um, they might want to do a study about the usage at the area to understand the justification for that. Uh, yeah. Sean, you ha you have your hand raised. Yes. Uh, often we at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conduct seabird surveys from a boat, and we approach though some areas and islands uh, within 500 feet. Uh, so we would be um, encroaching in that area. There is also currently a 500 foot buffer zone around Three Arch Rocks National Wildlife Refuge that was put in place uh, years ago. And I don't know the process of how that came about. Yeah, I was going to go go into that. Um, that was the next thing I was going to ask about and talk about, Andy, if I could. Please, Dave, go ahead. Point. Yeah. Um, so years ago, there was, as, as Sean mentioned, a, a, a buffer put around uh, several of the rocks in the Three Arch Rocks complex. And, you know, there are some some differences, you know, between those rocks and say the, the rocks off of Sea Lion, or sorry, the Sea Lion Rock off of Ecola Point. Um, the Three Arch Rocks are pretty far offshore. Um, they had massive amounts of vessel use around them. I mean, you know, any any given you know summertime day or you know any good you know ocean conditions day, there'd be you know lots of charter boats, lots of private you know sport boats, fishing boats, all around those rocks. Um, so that was identified as an issue and a, and a problem. Um, and but even with that identification. We needed to, to conduct a you know, fairly comprehensive study of observation um, around those rocks. We involved the Coast Guard and, and Oregon State Police in that study uh, it, and um, you know, basically documented what the disturbance events were. It was basically seabirds and, and, and sea lion disturbance was the issue. You know, documented the disturbance events and kind of went through a process, you know, probably took a year altogether. Um, and then, um, you know, proposed a, a seasonal buffer around the rocks that Oregon State Marine Board then uh, initially, you know, implemented. And um, again, it's it was just seasonal, um, and uh, the the time the closure time is uh, May first to September fifteenth, um, basically to correspond, <clears throat> excuse me, to correspond to the seabird, you know, kind of critical time for the nesting season and for the uh, pupping season for their uh, some sea light or seal pupping on, on that rock uh, or the rocks. Um, so that's just to give a kind of some background. So we, you know, we had a situation where there was known, you know, very well known, well seen, you know, massive amounts of boat use over years and years, you know, a study needed to be done. And then there was a closure, but the closure was just seasonal. Um, so just trying to compare that, you know, to, to, to uh, the rocks off Ecola Point, um, where, you know, we, we don't really know what the vessel use is, or, you know, maybe, maybe some of you here on the meeting today have, have a better idea of it, but, um, um, but it seems like there does need to be more steps taken, you know, if we were getting going to get to the point of a closure, um, some sort of buffer, some sort of closure. And again, it's it's Oregon State Marine Board. It's not it's not you know ODFNW, but just just wanted to provide kind of the history and background on on how that was done in the past. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, um, thanks, Dave. That's really helpful. Um, I was gonna pick on Margaret Treadwell and see if she can help remind me about when we originally thought about this idea. I mean, I think it's it's about there was some rec perceived or recognized potential disturbance to nesting birds uh, and other wildlife in those areas and kind of trying to take a precautionary approach. So we knew that there wasn't a lot of information available, but um, we felt it was a prudent measure to take at the time. And, but I, I wanna um, circle back to Margaret and kind of remind me uh, on this. It's been, it's been a while since we, um, we, we first, uh, talked about I first decided on this buffer yeah I was trying to sort of rack my brain too which has you know since been filled with other things unfortunately um but um you know I think 
particularly like off of Indian Beach, there is some seasonal fishing that takes place. And um, yeah, I think it was just to try and prevent any further disturbance to the nesting birds on the rocks, you know, during when the, when the tide, you know, when the tide is in. So, um, and, but I didn't know that there was a lack of data. I did talk with uh, um, the Dungeness Crab Commission about the rules that we had proposed and worked out with them something that they felt would be uh, would would work for them. So that should be reflected in all the um, updated materials from last time around. But yeah, I mean, there's not for that entire area. There's really not a lot of data on a lot of matters. So it kind of that kind of comes up a lot. I'd be happy to kind of go through my stuff and provide more background information um, if needed. I just haven't had a chance to do it. Sorry, that's not a great answer, Joe. <laughs> Laurel, go ahead. I'm just hoping maybe Dave can remind us who enforces the three arch rocks boating closure. Um, Cause I imagine enforcement of something like this would be somewhat difficult and it wouldn't be Oregon State Parks. Uh, it, it, it would be um, it would be Oregon State Police or, or the Coast Guard. And so related to that comment, have we engaged either of those parties in the feasibility of something like this? Not to my knowledge, Laurel. That's something that we talked about um, during our mm -hmm. Fogarty Creek workshop, actually, you know, reaching out to the state police to ask about uh, ability to enforce any of the harvest management or restrictions, um, whether that's from a location on the shore to be able to see the activity um, or, or otherwise. And so I, I would ask them to review uh, any and or all of our proposals and to provide us with comment and information um, that could be brought to OPAC uh, to help to inform our conversation about these sites. Sean, go ahead. One other issue that we've had at Three Arts Rocks, um, Fish and Wildlife Service used to put out buoys at the 500 foot mark, uh, but that became very expensive and the, the buoys would be uh, moved because of uh, ocean conditions, waves, storms, etc. And it just became very um, expensive for us to do and we no longer place those buoys. Yeah, thank you. So even in a place where there is an existing buffer, uh, they must rely on, on nautical charts then and or um, other navigational software? On the, on the navigational chart, uh, there is a note that states the uh, 500 foot closure area. So mariners can look at those charts and, and understand that, um, but it would be up to them, the mariners, to estimate the distance from the offshore rocks. And I believe there's signage, signage like in uh, uh, the port there that talks about the, the closure area. And yeah, they would have to rely on their navigation ability. I mean, a, a lot of boats would have radar. They could use radar to kind of range the distance to the rocks. Um, but, you know, a small boat, you know, a boat that doesn't have radar would just have to either, you know, rely on their, if they have a GPS with a plotter or something like that, or, or just their own judgment. And I think, you know, I think there is some, you know, it's, it's, it's a well-established, well-known buffer now. So I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of boaters out there and probably including charter boats that would, uh, you know, report, you know, kind of police the site themselves a little bit and, and report boats that are, you know, not, not obeying the buffer. I think Jesse maybe had her hand up before Laurel. Um, regarding enforcement of boats, I know that when I have worked with Haystack Rock Awareness Program in the past, if staff or volunteers saw boats that they thought were too close, sometimes it's hard to tell, sometimes it's easier to tell, 
Um, they called either OSP or US Fish and Wildlife Service, and maybe, maybe Kelly, if she's still here, could speak to what staff or volunteers do at Haystack Rock Awareness Program if they see boats that are too close. I'm honestly not aware because that hasn't happened since I've been here. So I, I don't actually know who we would call. Okay. So you don't, but you don't normally, I think we talked about this before too. You yeah. don't normally see boats that they just mm -hmm. don't get, we see it's a lot not of, a safe, it's not a safe spot. No, it's not the most, the most that we see out there are crabbing boats and they're pretty far out mm -hmm. going very back far out. That's really all we see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks Kelly. Yeah, go ahead, Laurel. And I think maybe Joe answered my question. This is just to motorized recreational vessels, because I imagine, I mean, the type of vessel that could get in that close would be things like kayaks or more non-motorized boats. And so, I mean, do you, I just don't know if it's an issue. Aren't there actually motorized? It sounds like it isn't an issue at Haystack Rock. So if there's a, it's a non-issue, boats can't get in there safely that are motorized you're excluding non-motorized boats, which are the boats that could get in there. I, we're having a lot of discussion about this topic. So I wanna, if, if you guys really think it's an issue and, and worthwhile discussion and study, maybe a study should be done, but I just don't, I just don't know if it's a demonstrated issue. It doesn't sound like there's evidence of that. So I feel like there are other topics that we really need to spend some time on. I don't know if folks wanna talk more about the boat thing. Um, I can, I, I think you're right, Laurel. I think um, what, what I, I'm not a local, so I will defer to Jesse, Deb, Kelly, and all the folks that live there. And can you reasonably tell us based on your anecdotal knowledge, if these type of watercraft do get into this space that we're talking about? Um, because I think, yeah, if I think if we don't know, then there's not much we can do about it. And we could table this and even make a decision right now to remove that consideration um, and maybe keep it as, if we do remove it, keep it as some, if this site is, it did get designated it'd be something that we would, you know, you know, potentially monitor some way. So I, I wanna uh, send it back to the people that live there. Yeah, Tabia <laughs> has her hand raised or, or did. Um, I am a local and I have not seen, I see the uh, fishing boats, the crabbing boats, um, but I don't see a lot of recreational boats um, getting that close to the rocks. They're usually a little bit farther out. Yeah, and just maybe to, to close the issue, um, Jason, I saw you shaking your head. I was wondering if you've had any enforcement or uh, safety issues that you've had to respond to in the area. We issue uh, dory launch permits from our PD, and they're all um, at least 300 yards south of Haystack Rock, and they don't go north from there. They only hang in that area there close to shore. Thank you. Uh, Deb? Yeah, back when we were researching this, I spoke to somebody at the Crab Commission too, and, and they didn't see there was any problem with what, you know, keeping, I think it was 500 feet because it wasn't safe for them to get closer. And also I live up high here and I can see all the way to Ecola Point and almost down to Haystack Rock. And we sit here and watch boats or if they go by, it's mostly cruise ships we out in the, in the horizon. And very rarely do we see anything but crab boats. Thank you. Go ahead, Laurel. I was just going to suggest for the, you know, in the name of moving forward to the other topics that if folks don't think it's an issue, maybe, or we could research it and, you know, somebody could do some monitoring of the issue over time to see like they did for three arch rocks, see if it becomes an issue. And then we could use adaptive management to address it at that time. This feels like we have a lot of other things to cover. I don't know if that's the collective that would be my suggestion, or... Laurel. I agree with Laurel. Yeah, let's move on. Okay, thank you. Um, 
maybe I'll circle back around to Dave, um, who was on a roll with his questions, and see if uh, you have further questions. No, that that was it. That was it for me. So so, keep moving. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So I did have a follow up question to Dave's question though. So is that okay, Andy? Go ahead, Laurel. Yeah. Uh, at clear point of clarification. So no harvest rest restrictions at E. coli, but same restrictions as in every other marine garden for Chapman. Is that correct? Because I thought that there were harvest restrictions at E. coli before. Is that, that's not the case? That's what I uh, heard, but, but I'll let others verify it. The responses, my, the responses from the coalition from last year, one year ago, um, stated that they were amenable to the agencies um, dropping the restrictions. So that, but that was at both sites now um, that there is an MEA proposed at Chapman um, that would change because of the prescriptions that at four marine gardens. Um, but, uh, and we could discuss that today, but we had kept that, um, and the group was, was amenable to no harvest restrictions at Ecola. I thought that was just, okay, it's not our area of jurisdiction, but I thought that was just a comment about the subtitle, Dave, that ODFW had. I, I'm just trying to be clear for, was that for all harvest restrictions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Are you sure, Jesse? I am sure that's what the responses said from last year. So we, we have not changed that. We can discuss that today if the group wants to. And of course, there's still time going forward um, between now and OPAC, but um, we can discuss that. But yeah, that was that was in that was from last year. So another follow-up question, if I may, about the changes. Um for Chapman because it become the suggestion is that it would become a marine garden marine education area that the standard rules that apply to a marine garden would apply there for all types of recreational activity not just harvest is that accurate because the marine conservation area is the category that sort of allows for additional rules so would that be true for the other restrictions that you were proposing I'm assuming related to dogs and walking yes. on rocks. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yes. So it would be, um, so, in, so changing the MEA, changing from an MCA to an MEA um, would basically be education um, of the public, uh, discussing with the public the rules of OPRD, which are dog leash, um, owners carry leashes and voice command, respond to verbal command, uh, one muscle, all, all of the rules which we are familiar with um, at the other marine gardens. And, and then can I go back for a second? Because looking at notes now, um, just back to Ecola for the MCA, for restrictions, um, I am seeing a subtitle only that the restrictions would be no harvest restrictions subtitle only yeah jesse that's what i remember i remember that the the working group identified the the, the need um, or an unverified need for a subtitle restriction whereas i believe the, the working group did not question at all the the potential need for intertitle harvest restrictions so okay. and looking at the response it is it does specify only subtitle invertebrate harvest and since this was not a a proposal that impacted fishing um then then i think any uh clarifications for the marine conservation area at e cola uh, i would be interested in knowing about any algae harvest uh, take prohibitions. Is that something that was included in the proposal in the intertidal? 
and or or subtitle. I, I need to go be back and be reminded of the algae harvest prohibitions, but I think that would probably apply to the intertidal. For and Joe and then Laurel and okay. but but maybe go ahead, Jesse. Were you asking about algae for both sites or just uh, E. coli? E. coli, because if you change to a marine educational area, then the harvest restrictions right. associated with that uh, would be a prohibition on intertidal algae harvest. I need to look at the notes about algae harvest. I don't have that at, right at my fingertips. So maybe you could answer the questions, then I'll look. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Joe and then Laurel. Yeah, thanks, Andy. It's it's coming back to me. The um, yes, we did propose at both um, Chapman and E. Cola when they were both designated as MCA for um, no for uh, reduced harvest of shellfish invertebrates, but it was higher than at an MEA because we wanted to allow the public to collect enough shellfish for as family per day. So I think it was like 20 something um, mussels or shellfish per day that we allowed. Um, and that, so that was at E. coli as well. And then you guys had responded to consideration. Does that include subtitle and intertitle? And we said we're amenable to removing it from subtitle. Um, so that's that. Um, with algae, I'm pretty sure we, uh, and, 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 and Jesse, I hope you looked up your notes, but I'm pretty sure there was uh, uh, no algae take. And again, if it was for both subtitling and intertitle, I can't recall, but. Um, I'm still looking. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, Laurel? I think you already said what I was going to say, Andy, um, primarily that if it were a marine garden, if that was something that was designated, that the standard rule would be no harvest. Um, but, I, you know, we'd need to have discussion about what would be proposed at a COLA. Um, because if that's not a standard category, it's sort of up, it's been very highly variable as far as what the proposal, proposal groups have wanted or suggested. Yeah. And I don't know if that activity is even happening at these locations, you know, is it something that's necessary to prohibit if it's not an activity that is currently happening or being misused? Because the allowance is very small anyway, it's one gallon bucket, so you can't really take a lot of kelp in a one gallon bucket. Or you can take some seaweeds, you know, but still relatively they're considered souvenir quantities, so. Yeah, thank you, Laurel. Uh, you know, the marine conservation area was the one flexible category we had, which is again, why I asked again, just to clarify, it, it would seem inconsistent to allow algae harvest while you were prohibiting invertebrate harvest, um, just because then it's harder to communicate the messaging about why one or the other and, and it would be clear to, to speak about the importance of marine vegetation for the invertebrate community. Um, I think Joe and then Margaret had your hands up. Um, yeah, just uh, uh, I'll, I'll defer to Margaret and then I'll respond after her. I think she might have more information than me on, on that issue. Um, so let's see. <laughs> So for um, E. coli, let's see, we had, um, we had no harvest um, for algae, but then in the responses, we included algae in the, um, in the things in the subtitle that we were amenable to removing from harvest restrictions. So I guess the restrictions would remain in the intertitle, but not in the subtitle. Hey, Moses entered in the chat that the original proposal was for no algae harvest except by scientific permit, um, which I could see right. being consistent. And then the response that um, Margaret reminded us of was that uh, restrictions would remain in the intertitle. So I think it is important to keep them consistent. But also, um, 
you know, as it, I've heard a couple of times, well, if things aren't happening now, why restrict them? And I think part of what we're doing here is we're looking at the future. So we do wanna put some restrictions in place to prepare for the future. Um, muscle harvest has increased greatly at uh, both of these locations. So um, just as an example, and as you know, Oregon seaweed becomes uh, more desirable, that could also happen. So I do think it is important to keep um, to keep, you know, to have restrictions of some kind in these locations. Yeah, Margaret and then Dave. Sorry, I didn't mean for my hand to still be up. Oh, okay, Dave. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, I'm still a little bit confused. I, I, I think I know. I just want to make sure I, I, I know exactly what's being proposed. So for E. coli, we would have no invertebrate harvest in the inner tidal. That that would be the invertebrate restriction, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, and but but fishing like fish harvest would still be allowed, like people fishing from shore. Fishing from shore from the sand because it's yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then subtitle wouldn't have any restrictions. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to just wanted to just make sure because it went back and forth a little bit. Um, yeah. In in our regulations, we you know when we put a, a regulation on in, intertidal harvest, it it extends from extreme low water to extreme high water. Um. So it's you know pretty much any possible place where the tide or, or you know would would have influence. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, that's what we're clarifying this today. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna um, just do a, a brief summary of the restrictions and the modifications that I heard for uh, Chapman Point and Ecola Point. Um, at Chapman Point, the the site would be changed from a marine conservation area to, to a marine education area or a marine garden. Uh, that does include restrictions on invertebrate and algae harvest in the intertidal. There would be no uh, restriction of harvest in the subtitle for either invertebrate or algae. For E. coli point, there would be restrictions to invertebrate harvest and algae harvest in the intertidal, but there would be no harvest restrictions in the subtitle for either invertebrates or algae either. Uh, fishing from shore would be technically allowed in, in both sites. Is that consistent with the discussion that, so? Thumbs up. Did I, did I get that right? Yeah. OK. Laurel? I believe I also heard clarification on, because of the suggested change to a marine garden at Chapman, that there would be no additional recreation restrictions that aren't in place at every other marine garden. Correct. So that would be what we talked about in regards to climbing or walking on the rocks and or related to dogs. Is that correct? Well, just for, I mean, walking on rocks is, I mean, climbing on offshore rocks, you know, the part of the fish and wildlife yeah. raft, those are already prohibited are activities our... that's not allowed. Correct. Um, so when we said, you know, walking on rocks is walking on intertidal rocks, the other, I mean, if something's already prohibited, it's, already not allowed. Yes. And that was specifically at Chapman, but I think I heard the desire to maintain the restriction on walking on rocks in the inner tidal at E. Cola point. That, we haven't had that discussion yet. Okay, but... so, so I'd like to go there. I, I think that's yeah. the next place to logically go. Yes. And the, the driving concern there is increased visitation causing trampling of intertidal organisms and the loss of um, kind of the ecological biodiversity from that activity. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I guess I'll I'll ask Parks, uh, Laurel, um, you and your colleagues to talk about that from your perspective. Yeah, I definitely appreciate the concern of trampling and overuse of rock and tidal areas by foot traffic, but um, we do not have this restriction in place on any other shoreline segment on the entire Oregon coast, including our most highly protected categories of designation, our marine reserves. Prohibiting public access to the ocean shore is fundamental to our our you know our cause to provide and protect the ocean shore as you know from the legacy of the beach bill. Um, I think it would be a, a great departure from the standard, including the high standard set at our marine reserves to prohibit walking on the ocean shore state recreation area, which includes walking on intertidal rocks. Although I think providing messaging and interpretation and etiquette um, is really important to our visitors. So I think that that is an option to help encourage visitors to do the right things in these special sensitive habitats. I, I think it is a <clears throat> upward um, fight to um, pr prohibit access to portions of Oregon's Ocean Shores Rec State Recreation Area, especially as it might prohibit north-south south transit that is protected and fundamental to statute and rule that we are charged with implementing as an agency. So I see Mickey's hand up. Go ahead, Mickey. I really appreciate that input. That's very helpful, Laurel. I do think that this particular area, you could have um, potentially a way to say, if you are, you know, when you are walking on the beach, remain on sand, so that you're not actually in any way prohibiting access to the beach. Because this area, as you go around a cold point, there are always a few sand paths. So it's just a question of, is there a way to message, you need to remain on sand and not walk over these intertidal rocks. So it's not a prohibiting of access issue here. I think messaging that is, is really important. And then we do that, you know, on our, on our materials, we always encourage the visitors, not only for the safety of the inhabitants of the rocky intertidal um, shoreline, but also for visitor safety for them to walk on bare rock or sand whenever possible. I think that's the best for everybody involved, but outright prohibiting it in a case where there could be years or times when that those sand patches don't exist and north-south transit is prohibited depending on the conditions at any time of the year. I just, I don't think it's a good idea for safety, even if for no other reason, just for public safety to, to prohibit somebody from stepping on a rock if they need to step on that rock to get around an area to be safe. I, it, it just, I think messaging is really important and we're working with the LCD on getting back our Oregon Tidefuls website where we have that as one of our key messages to encourage the public to do that. Um, behavior in a way that minimizes impact to these special places. But I don't know if Justin or, or Ben would like to speak up about this point, but um, if only for safe, only for public safety, I don't think it's an appropriate um, regulation. I do think it's an appropriate messaging um, piece. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I, uh, I see both sides on this one. I, and I agree with Laurel's statement of our proposed position on this. I, I feel like uh, messaging and, and educating folks on the, pro the least impact of travel through the areas, it makes total sense. I can see all along we've had a little bit of a concern about uh, altercations with visitors and volunteers, you know, creating safety concerns uh, out there. And I think saying you can't step on the rock when that's allowed, uh, sections of the, the rock when that's allowed everywhere else, I think that could yeah, that could be some safety concerns, but maybe we could let them know that that's coming by our messaging and some advanced signage to make it rare that people do step on the rocks. But I think contacting someone who stepped on a rock around the point, I think, would could be a safety concern, and, as I said, and uh, probably time better spent other places to you know, have more impact versus those one or two percent of people that are not going to listen to anyone wouldn't listen to us for that matter. You know, so um, so there you go. Thanks for the time to update it. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, this is a question directed to 
I guess all um, parks folks on the call, what are the the points uh, or places that you do that outreach uh, at Ecola specifically for, for that kind of messaging we're talking about right now? Because I'm just thinking that just, just lends more support for me if we do go in this direction of, of more of the education that Chapman really is an important place as a kind of a gateway from the South for Ecola as a, a as an, and you know, if it goes forward as an MEA, it would really make it even more important to have messaging there. But I'm wondering how often are rangers out on the, out in that area, you know, you know, providing this messaging, is it from the top of the park? Is it from the website? Is it in, in the frequency? I'm just curious, currently based on your current capacity. Ben, you want to take that one if you're on? Yeah. Um, so the answer is not not often. We're not, <clears throat> unfortunately, we're not in a position to, I'm sorry, I've got some sunflower seeds in my cheeks, so I sound like a chipmunk maybe. Um, we're not in a position to, to uh, you know, have folks sort of boots on the sand standing out on the beaches as much as we'd like to engage people. Um, we do have, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has uh, a volunteer that stays at E. Cola and will do some uh, programming stuff at, uh, at E. Cola um, when they're not working at Haystack Rock. Um, and so there's some of that messaging that's delivered there. Uh, some of our printed materials, our online materials, talk about um, uh, respecting the ocean shore, respecting the all the marine life. Um, the uh, so, so we don't have as much um, as much conversation as I'd like, even with people up in the in the terrestrial park. But it is a message that we send to people as we're telling them where they can go to get to the beach. So, by the way, when you get down there, you know, please don't pick up the sea stars and please don't um, take a baseball bat, and start bashing things or scaring birds. So, um, not as much as we'd like, but that's where we are. Thanks. Go ahead, Laura. Just because Ben didn't mention it, uh, we do have a beach ranger assigned to that management unit um, for the Nahalem Bay management unit, which includes E. coli, Cannon Beach. Many folks on this call probably already know our beach ranger for that section because he's awesome. Um, uh, so if you don't already know him, um, be sure to say hi to him when he drives by on his truck because he is a great beach ranger. What, you're going to tell us his name, Laurel? You're going to keep it in suspense. <laughs> I don't know. I want him back for Ocean Shores <laughs> program. So, uh, hey, Eric, stop it. Uh, <laughs> Eric Crum is the beach ranger for the Nahalem Bay Management Unit, which includes Nahalem Bay, um, Ecola, Oz West. Um, he has some of the best, you know, amazing beaches in the whole whole world, I'd say. Thanks for bringing that up, Laurel. That, that's a good point. He does have quite a stretch to cover uh, the North North Tillamook Bay jetty to to north of Tillamook Head, which is quite a um, quite a stretch. Uh, Eric is pretty good at that. The thing that makes that beach a little more challenging is, in order to patrol it, you have to you know get out on foot and patrol it. And he's not a lazy guy at all. He loves being on the beach, but it, it's a time consumer and. He spends a lot of time making contact at Arch Cape and, and Cannon Beach and at Oz West. And, and then we have a snowy plover management area here on the Nahalem Spit, which consumes a lot of his time. So um, it's it, we're happy to have him. It's a uh, the beach rangers are a resource that we didn't have several years ago, and I think it's a good resource. Um, and I think we're leaning on him pretty heavy, but it's not it's not as uh, he doesn't have as much time to be in one uh, particular location as some others. Oh, this is Justin. I'd add into maybe we could look at our pre-arrival information uh, reservation holders get for the campground to include some more of the information we're trying to convey through that channel. That would probably be a much broader reach than poor Eric being screwing around the beach trying to put out all the fires, literally sometimes. I would. That's a great suggestion, Justin. We do that for our snowy plover areas, so those state parks that are close to snowy plover management areas, we include that pre-arrival information for park visitors that are going to be staying out overnight at parks, so they get that as part of their arrival material for the park. So that's definitely something we could work on. I'm, I'm sorry, I should 
formally put my hand up. So I wonder if that's something that we can work on with the local chamber too, to provide that message, right? With Sounds like an opportunity for pet uh, ed owner education as well. Uh, it Deb, needs to be pretty concise because it's, you know, there's a lot of information. So, but some really concise talk, talking points would be doable and season, you know, uh, season specific to, you know, during seabird nesting season, there could be something in there, which we do for plovers. So just a good to do item. So Deb and then uh, Jesse. So I, I had a couple questions. Who's Russell Bowen? I worked with him with the fireworks and he was extremely helpful. Is he's at E. Cola? Yeah, Russ is our lead ranger at E. Cola. Um, okay. So he, he kind of heads up the team that takes care of E. Cola and Tolawa. Also the flyer that I just did on dogs for the Cannon Beach, um, city of Cannon Beach, I did extensive research on it and anybody's welcome to look at that about dog education. Um, we can provide that for you that you could use in other places too, because that was really well thought of and done by a graphic artists as well. So um, that could be used up and down the coast. Go ahead, Jesse, and then Laurel. Thanks, Deb. Yeah, it is a great flyer. And if there is language there that state parks would be interested in, we could definitely send that to you, um, sharing in the, in the uh, spirit of sharing and collaboration. I just wanted to say that during the last few months, we did speak with, with Eric Crum, um, who really supports uh, the program at Haystack Rock. And in these conversations, there were a few reasons why this group decided to, uh, to change this designation. And it was because of the conversations that happened with state parks and with other uh, organizations around. Um, and so there is support for education. There is support for volunteers who educate. It seems that there is more support for volunteers who are educating in designated areas. Um, so that's something uh, that was um, important for us to consider when thinking about the change to, um, to, this, to this designation. Um, the, possibly, like, the potential for uh, an MEA at Chapman um, could definitely help with a lot of these uh, in getting information quicker to the rangers, which uh, I talked to more than one ranger in the last few months, and they do appreciate the time that is saved um, getting information from, from the volunteers to the rangers. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, thank you. Um, we just touched on it briefly with kind of a mention of, of education. Um, I, I think what I'm hearing, at least associated with the E. coli point proposal is that um, state parks, I guess is still expressing a uh, strong concern about a rule against walking on uh, intertidal rocks. Um, I'm hearing some agreement uh, from the panel that maybe understanding rationale and and other non-regulatory measures to address the concerns that have been brought forward. I just want to stop there and is, does that sound right to our, our panel? Um, yes, I think, you know, that uh, an MEA at Chapman could really help uh, increase the messaging about the rules um, at, at Acola and at Chapman. Um, and not just, I'm sorry, not the rules, but uh, the, uh, uh, you know, like a type of stewardship, walking on sand, encouraging, just like what they do at Haystack Rock, encouraging people to walk on sand. That, and, um, you know, I understand and hear Laurel when she says, you know, this would be the only place on the Oregon coast that they haven't done this yet and ask people not to walk on rocks. Um, so that makes sense to me. 
Um, and I'd love to hear from other members of the group, of the, of the North Coast group. Um, yeah, I agree. I think that is a heavy lift. Like Laurel said, it would be a new precedent. And I think um, the main thing, the whole over underarching thing to this thing is that we want E. coli to have to be a special place still for years to come. Because we know in the North Coast, it's one of the only remaining areas that is, you know, relatively pristine. And so we want to keep it that way, you know, for the wildlife, but also for the people that visit. So um, I still think it's worthy of an MCA, I, th I think, um, but I do feel that that entry point from the South um, where Chapman Point is just makes total sense to educate people. If we can't have stronger regulations there now, um, um, based on things like what we're talking about with this specific issue, then, um, you know, I, I see that model of an MEA at Chapman where people are entering and, and actually hearing from parks that we have this one park ranger that stretched for such a long distance that having more boots on the ground there from a trained volunteer group um, could really be beneficial. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Sean, you have your hand raised? Yes, um, so I may be a little confused on the activities that are allowed at marine gardens or education areas. Uh, is tide pooling an activity that is common in the marine gardens? And if so, don't people walk on the rocks when they're tide pooling? I think the point is they're educated to not walk on the rocks as much as humanly possible um, with interpretation about the rocks often being uh, encrusted with organisms that are sensitive to trampling and um, disturbance. Uh, I guess a, a footstep is a pretty big disturbance if you're a small snail. Um, so I think that's <laughs> the, the point, um, Laurel. Yeah, you already pretty much said it, Andy, okay. but I was just going to point out that the marine garden designation comes with it, sort of this expectation of high use and a desire to communicate and educate and provide and, and provide interpretive opportunities. Um, that's sort of what I think about when I think marine garden. It's high use areas that, that um, encourage and um, foster education and interpretive opportunities. Um, including tide pooling. And in places like this, like Cola and Chapman, often, not always, there is that opportunity to step on sand. Some of our rocky shore areas, including marine gardens that get lots of use, there isn't always that opportunity. Some of them have a different dynamic type of different, different shoreline that doesn't have as much sand. Um, so for sure, there are places where you go tide pooling where it is not physically possible to step on sand and go tide pooling. Yeah, thank you, Laurel. Um, so I'm gonna have Angela and Tabia, but before I, I let you guys speak, I wanna um, recall that some of the working group discussion around the Chapman Point area was associated with infrastructure to allow, you know, because an educational area may draw additional people. And I, I know that there was conversation about uh, parking availability and access to that site. So I was just hoping to get some um, of your perspective on, on how the program would be implemented with, you know, you're gonna have a, a group of volunteers. How are you accessing or thinking about accessing the site for that purpose and knowing that um, you know, that was one of the challenges that the group talked about just with the limited uh, availability of, of having um, a, a lot of people go down there. And what I'm hearing is that you're already having a lot of people go down there. So let's educate them while they're there. But having a marine garden there may, may draw additional people. And I know that that was one of the other concerns. So if you could just talk a little bit about that, um, that'd be great. And specific to uh, parking in the neighborhood was was one of the concerns recognizing homeowners are sensitive about that topic. Um, I, 
so I, I had some hands go down, but maybe I'll go to Jesse and then I'll offer Angela and Tab Tabia any other follow-up opportunities. Okay, yes, because I would like to hear what uh, the other members of the group wanted to say before you ask these questions. So definitely like to go back to them. So I'll take the last question from Charlie first. Um, this is the first I've heard or thought about, um, but I was in a part of this group last year. I was working with the, some groups in the South Coast about neighbors being concerned about parking if there is a designation. Is that what you're saying, Charlie? I think that there was already a concern with the number of people parking to access the beach from that neighborhood. Okay. And, and adding a, a designation could grow those numbers. And so that's, I, I think, the, the conversation that we had as, as a group, just trying to understand how we balance okay. both of those. Yeah, that hasn't, I don't recall any um, letters of concern from the community about a designation increasing uh, parking. So that's something that this group would have to talk about. I, that we're not prepared. I, I mean, if the working group was talking about that, fine. Of course, <clears throat> it's already an issue. Um, it's already an issue uh, at Chapman, people trying to find parking. They park at Les Shirley. I know that if you get there early enough, you can park at Les Shirley and walk up to that location. Um, there's really hardly anywhere to park once you start heading west of Les Shirley up that hill. Um, and in terms of signage and infrastructure, <clears throat> um, the or, so organiz organizations have come forward saying that they would help us, help this group with, with signage. What I'm thinking about is um, in particular, Haystack Rock Awareness Program um, can help in some of their messaging. And there is some signage there that perhaps could be, uh, that's already there that could be altered to include Chapman. There are, there, yeah, there are, there are also signs um, at the very end of that road that heads up from, uh, from Les Shirley Park that heads all the way up there where the where the statues are and where the turnaround is there is and that's a that's a big big entry point there for walkers um, and also uh, renters of all the houses there so that's an excellent point where there could be a sign um, constructed there and I actually I think there already is a sign and so there just could be some alterations modifications of the infrastructure that is already there that the signage that is already there so that's what I'd say and then I want to hear what others want to say as well yeah thank you um Deb or, or Tevia did you want to say anything and then Laurel um, we had been talking about tide pools and tide pools by Chapman are most generally accessible by um, sand. And um, then E. coli point varies. Um, sometimes it's it's got pretty good sand access, other times it doesn't. And it it you never know from year to year what will happen there. Um, regarding traffic, I know or parking. I know the city is putting together a parking plan. Um, uh, people are going to come here, whether we have a marine garden designation or marine education area designation or not. And uh, in fact, even a lot of them, when the, um, when the river is low, they walk across from Haystack Rock over to Chapman Point. And, um, I don't know how much success a city will have with their parking plan. Cannon Beach is lousy parking, whether it's Haystack Rock, North End, South End, or Mid. It's bad. Yeah, Angela and, and then Jesse. So I just wanted to circle back around to um, the question earlier about um, how to tide pull without 
walking on rocks. And um, I, I appreciate Laurel's comment. There's, there's different um, parts of the coast that have different dynamics um, for sure. But in the two areas at the two different tide pool programs that I am a marine educator for, there's absolutely um, wonderful tide pooling to be done without having to walk on rocks. And um, if you'd like, come on down. I'd love to show you how to do it. That's what I, I live for is, is going down and showing people amazing things and doing it um, in a way that you can protect the environment. And I would argue that the reason these areas have such amazing tide pooling is because we encourage people to walk on sand and not trample over the living creatures. And that's why those creatures are there that I can, I can show visitors. Um, in my experience at both Chapman and Nicola um, points, um, you can absolutely tide pull without walking on rocks. You can walk on the sand. Um, however, you know, I understand you can't, I understand the, the thought about not being able to make a rule just at this place specifically not to walk on rocks, but that's why I think the educational element is really, really important because in my experience with interacting with the public, I, I, somebody needs to be out there to show them why walking on sand is preferable to walking on the rocks and just um, watching people's um, making the connection that what they're seeing is alive and not dead just because the tide is out. That's what's going to make the huge, huge difference in keeping these areas alive. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jesse, you had had your hand up. Do you still have any comments? Um, no, I lowered, lowered my hand, but I just wanted to um, um, echo now what uh, what Angela was saying um, that uh, the education area at Chapman is, I think, a very good idea in terms of helping to protect COLA um, as well as, as, as Chapman. And I've had some really great experiences when I worked with Haystack Rock. Um, in <clears throat> approaching the public that were standing on on top of large boulders and the the uh, always the excitement and surprise what of what they were standing on um, and coming down and just wanting to know more and then spending like an hour with a group of teenagers because they had no idea. Um, so it's it's a it's a great opportunity. Um, but there are a lot of areas on the coast. I think I think uh, Harris Beach is an is a marine garden, an education program like Haystack Rock, and there are people just all over the rocks there. They just don't really have any idea. There are some great educational signs, but people do so much one on one interactions with um, with visitors do so much more than signs. People read the signs, but they just don't really. They get down to the tide pools, and then they're just very excited. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Laurel. Had some clarifying questions about the, um, the ideas about the um, volunteer interpretive programming. Um, there are programs that sort of do an intercept, like a roving interpretation and capturing the existing people on the beach. And it sounds like that's what you're hoping for here, but I haven't, that hasn't been completely articulated because uh, it related to the conversation about parking. Um, if you're going to be promoting programs, saying come to this program about tide pooling, there's not a lot of parking. I think that was some of the discussion in the working group is that if you're attracting more people or are you just, you know, intercepting the folks that are already there, that's a different type of interpretive um, program. And I'm just curious if this group has had any discussions about that because I don't see the capacity in that area for parking for attracting, you know, if you're putting out on social media, hey, it's XYZ days and we want you to come to Chapman Point, there's, you know, where would they park for that type of program? I, I don't see that as, I know that that occurs at Haystack Rock, you know, sort of encouraging folks that, to come to the programming. So I wonder whether this group has talked about that as it relates to the logistical challenges of this location for any sort of, I mean, they will come regardless, right? Because they're already there, but are you planning on promoting it um, as come to these type of programs? It doesn't sound like it, but I just wanted to make, you know, have that discussion in this group. So um, it's just, a, you know, being there to intercept people 
that are already there is different than, you know, broadcasting your programs to say, come, more people come. <laughs> Does that make sense? Sorry, I'm just a little rambling. Yeah, go ahead and, and respond to that, Jesse and or Angela, whichever of you would like to go first. I'm going to let someone else respond there. Kristen and Angela, I see have their hands up. Jesse, I'm going to go ahead and respond real quick. So my name is Kristen Vans. I'm the Marine Program Coordinator for uh, North Coast Land Conservancy. Uh, and that Marine Program was formerly the Friends Group, the Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. And I was the Program Coordinator for there. Uh, I run the Tidepool Ambassador Program out of Short Sands Beach, which is in service to Cape Falcon Marine Reserve, and we do roving interpretation. We do not promote our program whatsoever, and I just want to say that we are in support of the Marine Education Area at Chapman, and we are uh, in support of spending my time and other staff time to train volunteers in a very similar manner uh, and to create a program in a very similar manner if that is what this group deems necessary. Um, which sounds like, yes, it's more than likely with the direction that we're going in um, because the site's overly promoted by um, organizations uh, already. And so the, the idea is to capture visitors where they are and to lessen the impact as much as possible in the process. Yeah, thank you. Angela? Yeah, uh, Nadia put in the comments, and, and Kristen just said it too, at the Tidepool Ambassador Program, we don't advertise when we're there, we're just there for the people who are already showing up, and I think that would be a good approach to take at Chapman as well, but as far as like attracting more people, the, the way I put it is that train has already left the station. People already are showing up, they're parking all over the place, that's already an issue. So um, I don't think um, having education there is going to um, make more of an issue. It's already happening. Yeah, thank you. Jesse, do you want to comment before? And then Dave, you have your hand raised. Yes. Um, so to answer Laurel's question, yes, roving. We will not be advertising um, educational programs or that type of a thing. Within our volunteer networks, we will be uh, working on getting some monitoring set up, some more monitoring set up in that place, but we won't be advertising that either. So we'll leave that to Haystack Rock. They've got a great program going there. So this would be more, more roving um, and in interception. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Dave. Um, yeah, thanks. Another question about interpretation. I realize the you know, the desire to set up the, the program at, at Chapman and kind of intercepting people that, you know, may later on go to ECO and hopefully carry that message with them. Do you, do you plan to do any interpretation at ECOLA or any education like intercepting people there, or is it really going to all be at Chapman? I go ahead and respond to that, panelists. Um, Dave, that's a good question. Well, oh, Jesse, do you want to go first, or you go ahead? Then I'll. Okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say that's not something we have discussed a lot. Um, I think the the goal initially, and we're starting to do it with some of the monitoring, like today is doing with the oyster catchers there through our oyster catcher program, is um, the focus is on Chapman really, and I think you know down the line if we had more capacity to get to E. Cola at some point, that would be um, great. But, you know, I think, you know, first we need to get a designation and then we need to coalesce our, our um, volunteer, which we're hearing, you know, Kristen just spoke that they have capacity to help us. And so we need to pull that together first, focus on Chapman. And then if all things go well, you know, I think it'd be great to have some ability to get to E. Cola to the outreach as well. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. And Yes, um, my understanding is that Oregon, Oregon Parks and Rec hopes to build their interpretation program again. And so when they do that, and we, we would love uh, all, of, uh, all of the groups, I think, that are being represented today, including Oregon Shores, um, would love to uh, collaborate with Oregon State Parks um, on their interpretation program. And so whatever they think that might 
you know, be necessary at Ecola um, and then them stepping in there would, would be great. But we have, like Joe said, focused on when we kind of really started looking at uh, how uh, Chapman is just this major entry point into Ecola in many ways, um, that uh, that would be a great, a great place to focus our efforts and focus ed education and, um, and intercept efforts. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, one of the um, the points of clarification that that I'd like to maybe expand on a little further, um, and specifically related to um, kind of education and interpretation, is uh, what the panel um, proposers would would like relative to uh, E. coli marine conservation area and, and pets off leash. I think I heard that this is something that you were okay uh, having um, be a, a non-regulatory management measure that's focused on through stewardship. But I just wanna clarify that for my understanding of the, the conversation to date. So, cause I did, I think I still heard there's a desire to have a reduction in the number of instances of, of wildlife and pet interactions. Yes, definitely. Um, so this was one thing in the slideshow uh, and in the in our comments that um, we are unclear of what the rules are at E. coli. Um, and so I know that uh, Laurel maybe has been looking into that to try to figure out what the boundaries are. I have looked and looked, I've spent so much time um, looking at beach rules for dogs and really can't find anything other than um, that dog owners must carry a leash and their dogs must be uh, able to respond to voice command, which we know does not happen a lot of the time. That's why Haystack Rock is so great at um, letting people know, uh, asking people if they wouldn't mind leashing their dogs um, around the tide pools. Uh, so it seems like there's some, uh, it's it's unclear about what the rules are at Ecola State Parks and dogs, where those boundaries are. And if those boundaries don't go down to the water, um, we would like to talk about, about that. We just kind of need to know. And if, if not, then we'll just use uh, the marine education program, hopefully at, at Chapman to really hammer home how important it is um, to keep dogs away from wildlife um, and, the, and the black oyster catchers. So I'll let, I'd like Laura, I, I, I'm curious, Laurel, what you have found out. Yeah, Laurel, go ahead, I, speak of the I devil. Didn't, I didn't really have hi. to do, yeah, my dogs are just <laughs> coming over to say hi. Um, I didn't have to do any research because I mean, it's always, it's clear to me. So it's un unfortunate if it's unclear to the public. So maybe that's some improvements that we need to do about messaging on our website. Dogs are allowed on the beach with, you know, the restrictions that you mentioned about being within sight, um, sight and voice command of the owner with the leash on hand on the beach. So if they're on the beach on the Ocean Shore State Recreation Area, there are rules that apply to the Ocean Shore State Recreation Area, Division 21 rules. If they're in a state park, then Division 10 rules apply, which is dogs need to be on a leash. So on the beach, certain set of rules apply in the state park, upland, if you're on in an upland park, if you're in a parking lot, if you're in an area with grass, let's say that not the beach, that the park rules apply. So the only places on the beach that have seasonal dog restrictions uh, are a requirement of our habitat conservation plan for the Western Snowy Plover. And those are seasonal restrictions that we put in place for the protection of, protection of endangered species in collaboration with US Fish and Wildlife Service to establish those rules through a multi-year public process with many public meetings. And even then um, it was difficult to get those restrictions in place. So we, that's the only place where we have dog restrictions seasonally, dogs, on, dogs aren't allowed in snowy plover areas. It's not just on leash or off leash. Um, but I hope that clears things up. And on the beach, they need to be under control. In the park, they need to be on a leash. And if I misspoke, our park manager will correct me. 
So I guess intertidal land adjacent to the state park would be categorized as the state park and the rule would apply in that location? No, that's the, or, that's or the that's ocean the shore. shore. That's the ocean okay. shore. That's the ocean, ocean shore, shore state recreation okay. area goes from the vegetation line, which is either the statutory vegetation line or established line of vegetation to the extreme low tide. That's the ocean shore state recreation area from the Columbia, you know, from the yep. Washington border to the California border. Um, except in Swamp Plover seasonally. And there are other rules that apply that can be enforced as far as um, wildlife disturbance that is you know, prohibited activity in state park and ocean shore rules. Um, so those so, activities that are occurring are illegal otherwise, right? So wildlife disturbance is something that is, depending on what exactly is happening, could be a federal federal rule or a state rule that's being broken. Um, so it's a matter of rules exist. It's uh, that protect those resources. It's a matter of enforcement. So Jesse or Joe, I'll leave it to you to decide. I was going to say. Thanks, Laurel, for that clarification, because I talked to you earlier, because there is on the website that I, when I was researching this, it says, you know, what you're saying, but it, it shows a map of the state park going all the way to the water. It's very, you know, a cruder map, but still, um, it's unclear from some of your parks resources where the boundary of the state parks are whether they are, they are down, like Andy said, down to the intertidal or just in the upland. But thanks for that clarification. Um, so that, yeah. So I guess the next step for me is I'm curious to hear from members of, of the coalition that live down there, like how much do they see dogs um, in that area? Looks like Laurel has. A I just had one more thing related sure. to rules that are different depending on where you are on the ocean shore, there is a section of ocean shore rules that's specific to um, rules that have been requested by local governments. So there is that section, which um, is different for certain activities up and down the coast, but that's at the request of the local governments. So that's division, um, uh, is it 30? <laughs> um, I'll find it, I'll tell you guys which section my brain has decided but to not, not remember the, the number. Parks, is that part of that, like? That, no, that's for, the, that's for the ocean shore. So there are ocean shore rules that are specific to sec segments uh, of the ocean shore okay. that have been requested by local governments. So there are some rules that apply to the seaside beaches that are different for seaside. There are some yeah. rules that apply, like there's a specific language for the city of Cannon Beach but it mirrors the ocean shore language for dogs. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mickey and then Jesse. Sure, you had asked Joe what, for the locals, what did we notice? And there is an incredible amount of dog activity on Crescent Beach and at the tide pools everywhere. I've watched birds being chased in every part of that beach. So. I would say that I personally think that if there's not an opportunity for a dog regulation, that there actually does need to be some education on the ground at a Cola Point because it is that big an issue and there are so many people who do access Crescent Beach directly by trail rather than coming through Chapman Point. But that's, that's my personal experience. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, I'll go Jesse, Tabia, and then Sean. Um, so my experience, I live on the North Coast um, and Chapman has always been one of my very favorite places. I see people bringing their dogs there as kind of a dog park because it's not, it's not as filled with people, although it is getting that way as Haystack Rock. So they come down and it's just becoming this, I mean, there are so many dogs there. It's just, it's, it's amazing. And so I think what I would like to say today is that, you know, listening um, to Laurel and others, and especially Laurel, like consider uh, how state parks could do better messaging. I really think that it's time to, um, for state parks and, and we could all collaborate on messaging about dogs. Um, it is, uh, I mean, I, I know that one of, the, one of the concerns about state parks is human safety. And I have heard uh, and seen um, and listened to stories about dogs uh, interacting with uh, people on the beach that is not keeping people safe. 
Um, and so I would love to see some collaborative messaging from state parks on their social media um, and in other places, maybe even on, on their uh, websites to, and, and then through the messaging of, of, of stewardship groups like, um, like Haystack Rock and hopefully this group and others about, about dog etiquette. You know, we've got tide pool etiquette. How about some uh, dog etiquette? Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Tabia. Um, my personal firsthand experience is that um, dog owner behavior needs some modification. We have people being injured, we have other dogs being injured, and we have wildlife being injured, and it's become a significant issue. Um, we're having more elk interactions. And um, I also spent a lot of time at the Wildlife Center. So I have probably the most hand, firsthand experience out of anybody on this panel. And um, this is uh, something that really needs education. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Sean. Laurel briefly mentioned this, but uh, uh, seabirds, uh, including black oyster catchers are protected under a federal law, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, and so that is in place and that includes take and disturbance. Uh, that disturbance and take also apply not only to well, any, any type of disturbance caused by uh, dogs, people, or drones, anything like that, it applies. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Uh, go ahead, Laurel. I was just gonna say, I posted some links in the chat in response to questions about Division 30 rules, as, as well as some information that we have already about positive information with a W, positive information for your pets about good pet behavior. We also have a brochure related to encouraging positive pet behavior in parks and on the beach. Um, I don't know if it's still in, you know, in print. I, I, ben would uh, know if it's available at Ecola currently, but there is a brochure trying to encourage uh, positive positive pet behavior. And there's definitely always room for improvement on that and messaging. And we are um, continuing to work with our partners, including the Oregon Coast Visitors Association. I'm on a, a group with, with Dave and other uh, natural resource managers to look at messaging in collaboration with the tourism industry, including things like trash and pet behavior and um, reducing disturbance during nesting season for plovers and other seabirds that those type of resource impacts. So um, we're currently working on a campaign about, you know, re reducing waste to reduce predators, which negative um, impact impacts coastal wildlife in all of our special places. So there's always room for improvement and I welcome working with any of the folks on this call to improve that communication. Yeah, thank you, Laurel. So I'm sensing maybe our conversation around pets has um, come close to a conclusion and that there's uh, maybe an understanding that we may be leaning more towards education um, and, and not trying to add an additional regulation that relates to dog and more specifically to people behavior related to management of their animal on the ocean shore. Um, Deb, you have your hand raised. Right, I just wanted to say um, in Cannon Beach, we have a veterinarian here um, who has worked with me on the flyer that we did and he, we are in the disaster response for animals here. And he's been on calls with elk and, you know, a dog got kicked a couple months ago um, and uh, there's been other injuries as well with people and so with the collaboration of you know him responding to a lot of those calls for pets and he is working with me on the flyer and also what she said about I, I did 
uh, roam the internet and the state park stuff and put that all together into one space with his his knowledge too of how to you know pet pet control and voice command and all of that into that flyer. So we are going to be a, doing a really big educational push on that and um, on social media, on you know media stations, everything. It'd be great if we could all collaborate and I'd be happy to work with anybody on that. We, we do have a group here already that's very active in that area with you know the black oyster catchers and now that, that you know feeds into the dog thing too. So we, I'd be happy to share any of that with you and the research and he would be willing to share his knowledge as well. I was just going to say that our social media folks are willing to share partner information that gets posted, you know, if it's appropriate and fits with, you know, messaging that we want to do jointly. So I just send me the information. I'm happy to work with them to get that out as appropriate. Okay, we'll do. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. I just wanted to state that just to recognize, I, I wanted to recognize um, that uh, this is the second uh, meeting that I've been in for these designations. And I really appreciate the conversations and synergy that happens between the agencies and the volunteers and the communities. This is one of the best thing that's come out of these uh, designation uh, processes. Um, just hearing these, uh, hearing, uh, sharing the, the, the amount of work that Dev has done and the community of Cannon Beach for the dogs is so important and, 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 a, and a big thing. And uh, just thinking about Deb sharing this information with the state um, is, is just really wonderful to hear. So I just wanted to, to say that. And also Deb, I don't know if you were aware, this is the first time I've heard what um, Laurel was uh, sharing about the local government requests. I wonder if that could uh, work into these rules somehow. So I, I, I suggest you talk more with, with, with Laurel about what, what might, be able to be done. Um, and uh, so to answer your question, um, Andy, I think that the group uh, might be amenable uh, to removing that restriction, considering all the work that is being done by the city. Um, and, uh, and with, you know, if, if an MEA indeed can happen at Chapman, it would be a huge reduction in, uh, poor behavior. <laughs> um, we know that it works at Haystack Rock. Uh, we had conversations with, with Kelly, um, and I have been there before and 99% of the people are just like, oh yes, of course. I, um, I will leash my dog. Um, there, it's wonderful to to see that to see that in action and that happening. Um, and that could happen at Chapman. It would it would really change things there if there was a, a, a roving group of um, asking folks to uh, uh, just to leash their dog near the um, near the near the tide pools and let them know of of the rules that already exist of of the state park rules that already exist. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Um, I, I too just want to say I've really valued the conversations that have happened and have really um, taken a lot away from the collaboration and the um, consensus building nature around actions that we can do to improve our uh, rocky intertidal health. So um, I do want to um, say I think that that really does kind of touch on all of the elements of of the first kind of big bullets associated with kind of the additional restrictions for, for climbing, walking on the rocks with dogs. Uh, we talked, you talked in your proposal about the, the firework ban in, in Cannon Beach, which addresses that concern. So that's not a part of your recommendations any longer. Uh, the re, you have removed kind of a subtitle uh, harvest restrictions, which was another one of the considerations. So I think that does address everything in that first bullet. We did already talk about the boat buffer. We talked about the, you know, identifying the need for and, and not really having a, a good understanding of how often boats occur in that area with, with your group, you're considering basically uh, removing that recommendation. We did talk about uh, the drone issue, which is, being addressed via other uh, rulemaking by state parks and could go towards addressing the concerns that have been raised in association with this site. Um, 
I think there was a recognition about the issue of kites uh, being a disturbance, but I just want to clarify uh, with the panel that that did I hear that in your presentation that you're also um, factoring that into the um, modifications to the original proposal? Was that the case where you kind of um, did you did you modify your proposal relative to kites? Um, and, and anyone on the panel, go ahead, Jesse. Um, yes, I think so. Um, I think that was a part of, I'm just pulling up the slideshow now, but yes, I think that we were amenable to that and just recognizing that drone rules are happening. So that's my recollection. If anybody else in the group uh, uh, remembers differently, please speak. Great. Um, Thumbs up from Joe, uh, a hand raised from Laurel. Laurel, did you? It wasn't about kites, but um, you know, maybe that could be part of, if if it's an issue there, I don't know. It seems like you wouldn't wanna fly your kite next to rocks because you lose your kite, but I, I don't know. I uh, wanted to make a comment about the ongoing drone process that if folks aren't currently engaged in that and wanna know how to plug in to provide your feedback on that process, just let me know because, I am a representative on that group working to move forward drone rules that include protections for our, our sensitive rocky shore species. So great. Thank you, Laurel. I, I would appreciate seeing those. So um the, the current draft rules are on our website along with information about providing public comment. But if you want to make sure that you're engaged in the process that's moving forward, there might be ways to do that. Um you know, if you're a group of an interested party that wants to be represented, or I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I'm just letting you know that if you're interested, just let me know and we can, Joe's involved already, so maybe he represents the group, so. Um, yeah, they all know about it. <laughs> it's really good to know that the draft rule does include a, a prohibition on, on launch and, and recovery in the state park area, so that's great. It, it includes that prohibition for designated rocky shore areas. So it isn't specific to E. coli. It is something that we put in there to try and capture. Most of the designated sites also have other conflicts with potential disturbance of marine wildlife. So that's why that was put in there. Um, it isn't specific to E. coli. It's um, ge general for all designated rocky shore areas. And that is solely for launching and landing. Again, I think somebody already mentioned this, but we don't control the airspace the federal government does. So we can control, you know, boots on the sand, launching a drone or in a park. We can't control the airspace. Yeah, thanks, Laurel. Um, Sean, you have your hand raised. Yeah, there's also already a uh, law against launching or landing from Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge, any, uh, any refuge that's prohibited. Okay, great. Laurel, is that a new hand? Yeah, sorry, it is. I just forgot to say no something. Problem. I thought, that's, that thought this group might be interested and in, is that we are having discussions or have had discussions with US Fish and Wildlife Service and ODFW about seasonal, you know, having those restrictions be seasonal because they would make the most sense during season that um, covers both snowy plover nesting season and also the bird nesting season and marine mammal um, pupping and haul out season. So just so you know, you know, that is possible that the restrictions would apply for a specific season, which hasn't been finalized yet, but it has been discussed to include snowy plover season that would start in March and then extend through September. So it'd be the hypoth potentially, just so folks know, that is it something that's been under consideration. Um. Great. Looks like that got a couple of other thoughts. Uh, Jesse and then Deb. Um, Laurel, can you clarify? Did you say that that would be for other shorebirds like black oyster catchers as well? Seasonal. But the season, that season that we have just, I mean, it's not, I'm just saying that's a draft, that's a very draft, but we've discussed with ODFW and US Fish and Wildlife Service what an appropriate season, if it, if it was a seasonal and that hasn't been decided, so maybe I should, it's just, 
we've had discussions about what would make sense if we were going to have a seasonal drone restriction in places that have nesting seabirds. I see. And, Interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But that's not in the draft rule. It's just something we've discussed, but I thought it would be of interest to this group. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Deb. Um, I was just wanting to touch upon the marketing plan with, you know, getting the word out with education and you know, all these things and coming together once these things are decided is with fireworks, we, we did social media with 100,000 people, you know, on Facebook. And then we did the radio, the press releases for the news stations and the news stations really have a big impact on educating people. And I'm sure they, you know that, but I was just wondering, we're working with state parks to get this information out. We all work together to make it a, you know, safer and get the public aware of all of this. And um, my, the man, man I work here with here, the veterinarian, he's also a photographer of birds and wildlife. So we, we put together these flyers and stuff and send them all out. Um, but it'd be great if we all were working together on this educational approach um, for Oregon in general on the coastline. So and my background's marketing. So I, I'm really into all of the different avenues and power of different ways to educate people and outreach. And I think it has a lot more power than a lot of people realize. Um, I mean, if we could do fireworks and not have one thing go off here, <laughs> it was pretty miraculous. So the, the magic of that is, is huge and, and networking and all of that. So I would like to see us all work together to, to make you know, the public really aware of what we're trying to have, have a strategy on it that we all support. Yeah, thank you uh, for saying that, Deb. That would be consistent with our, our revised Territorial Sea Plan Part 3 strategy. There really is a, a stress on coordinating interpretive efforts, on inclusion of a number of voices in the creation of, of those materials. Um, and, and I agree, there is a lot of strength and synergy and, and partnerships that can be brought together and consistent messaging. So. Um, really do appreciate that comment. Um, I want to turn our conversation because I, I think this could be a, a relatively quick um, discussion. And one of the last, the last bullet that we had was uh, reconciliation of boundaries with respect to the statutory vegetation line. I'm just clarifying that, you know, that was acknowledged in both proposals that it they would be amenable to adjustment to the mean high water line. Um, so I don't think that is an issue we we really need to spend any more time on except to document that fact. Um, is, is that correct from your understanding? I'm seeing heads nod. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Great. So uh, at this time, I think we have addressed almost all of the, the bullet points that I have on my list from the considerations that were included in the original evaluations. Uh, thank you panel for, for providing an excellent presentation to help us understand some of those changes. Um, In, in other workshops, I've tried to, to do a big wrap up and summary of, of all that I've heard. There's a little bit more complexity on this one, but I'm willing to give it a go just to, to really try and do one, one more last kind of roundup of everything that I've heard. And um, one thing I, I, I would encourage you to do and to think about, which I'll touch on in a little bit is just in, your cover letter to OPAC really making clear the changes that this group has uh, agreed to as a part of their proposal. And, uh, you know, there may be benefit in just reminding OPAC, you know, what the total package looks like now. Um, of course, you will be able to present to OPAC, so that will be an opportunity to really do so. Um, but I would, I would encourage that. So, I guess I'll, I'll pause for a second to see if there were any other comments, questions from our panelists 
related to our conversations that we've had today, it looks like that got Laurel's attention. Laurel, do you have something that uh, right. you want to bring it's up? It's more before? of a, a process, a process question, Andy, just for the, for my sure. sake, but for everybody else, um, yeah. maybe that has similar questions. What does the timeline look like? You know, do we have something that sort of summarizes the modified proposal? How far in advance do we have that before the OPAC meeting? Just sort of, can you, I think maybe you could talk about it during next steps, just so that, you know, yep. how, how much time would we have it before OPAC and have an opportunity to digest it and everything? Yeah, thanks, Laurel. Maybe I'll just go uh, to my presentation now where I have some of those uh, talking points. Um, and the my idea of this is that uh, I would work with agencies to uh, produce a summary documenting any kind of remaining agency considerations or thoughts related to uh, our discussions today. Um, that the, our proposers would, would likewise be able to um, generate a cover letter that would talk about the site proposal and talk about the modifications uh, that may have been that may have come out of our workshop today um, and again documenting kind of additionally what the the proposals are for OPAC those will be compiled together into an information packet um, that OPAC will have along with the original proposals and all of the public comments that were associated with them uh, by site. Um, and each proposal uh, entity will be able to present to the Ocean Policy Advisory Council at their June meeting, uh, where OPAC will be able to learn about uh, these if, if they have not been staying tuned and um, to, to be able to ask questions. I think there, there's still an opportunity an opportunity if, if proposers want after hearing from OPAC, they could propose additional modifications to their proposal, but you know, I'm not gonna go there yet until those conversations happen. Uh, the end of the process at this time would be OPAC making a decision at their fall meeting. Uh, Joe, you have your hand raised. Yeah, just kind of following up on your answer to laurel just about the process um if there what what kind of discussion can opac have on proposals between when they get new information in june or they get the summary of information packet um between that meeting and the fall like are they can they meet or not to um deliberate at all or is this something that each individual member of opac has to do on their own or how, how is this yeah, if if there if there was a, uh, a a modification that came out of the discussion at OPAC, um, uh, the proposal teams could email me, and I could email those directly to uh, the full council, so that they would have those as early as it was uh, knowledgeable and, and as they were able to. Um, there there will be public comment opportunities associated with each. OPAC meeting where the proposals are being uh, heard or or voted on. Um, so that would be you know, my approach is I would I would have direct communications to them that would inform them of any change to any of the proposals that came following the OPAC meeting. I would I would hope that most of the issues ha have been um, kind of resolved as a part of our conversations and a part of the discussions that we've had. Um, I guess I'm thinking more about how some OPAC members will for the first time be hearing for these proposals in June, and then we'll be making a decision several months later, and then what kind of meetings can take, can take place between OPAC members um, between to discuss what they heard in June to make a decision in the fall. Right. So, you know, one thing that I, I, as a staff person for OPAC, am careful about is you know, impromptu meetings of the of the council. If there's more than eight members of the OPAC committee that are in a, a single meeting, that's actually a, a quorum, and it would it would constitute a, an OPAC meeting. 
Um, so that is unlikely to happen between the, the June meeting and a, a fall meeting. Um, that being said, one of the things I am doing is I'm, I'm taking the recordings from our workshops and I will be posting those. So they are, they will be available as materials for OPAC members to reference as a part of the discussion. Um, in addition to anything that uh, comes to them the day of their uh, the meeting with the proposals themselves. Uh, Jesse, you have your hand raised. Yes. Um, so was planning to send you today, um, mm -hmm. probably now Monday, uh, the modified responses from 2021. Can you, will you be sending those on to OWEB? Uh, or, I'm sorry, OWEB, oh my goodness. OPEC. OPEC. <laughs> Well, oh, to, to OPAC um, for um, so that they can have them now, or will you wait until June? And then the second part of my question was, if not, can we send their, our modified responses to OPAC members individually? Well, I was hoping to have them, uh, the package of information together with at least two weeks ahead of time so that OPAC members have the ability to uh, look at the materials. Um, I, I would really recommend that they watch some of the, the workshops that have taken because those it really does demonstrate uh, consensus and, and the conversations that we've had around the nuances for each site. Um, but I, my intent was to have them have the information on hand a couple of weeks ahead of the meeting, um, which would include your cover letter, our, our agency summary of, of the meeting and um, that they would have that as a benefit right from the get-go. Um, you are certainly welcome to communicate directly with, with OPAC members uh, if you'd like. Um, they, you know, we are actually updating their roster because of recent additions. So that will be posted to the website soon. Um, go ahead. So just um, to clarify, if we did send you the modified responses, mm -hmm. uh, would you include those in your package to OWEB along with the cover letter? Yes. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing for a moment. And I'm going to try and uh, summarize what I have heard as a part of our conversation today. Um, I'm going to maybe blend some of what I've heard for, for both sites because the information applied to, to both. But I will, I will start with the, the Chapman point. Uh, what was a marine conservation area proposal is now a marine education area or a marine garden proposal. Um, there would be uh, no additional restrictions related to climbing, uh, walking on the, the intertidal uh, rocks. Uh, education and uh, would be used for kind of stewardship of, of the resource, both with uh, disturbance of, of animals on the rocks and with um, pet wildlife interactions for off leash dogs, uh, fireworks are officially uh, banned on uh, beaches and within um, the city of, of Cannon Beach. So the, the fireworks recommendation is no, is no longer uh, relevant and, and withdrawn. Um, from the harvest management perspective, there would be uh, the standard harvest restrictions associated with the marine educational area that would be no invertebrate harvest uh, and no algae harvest in the intertidal area. Um, there would not be restrictions in the subtidal area for either algae or invertebrates. There is also no associated regulatory buffer um, or uh, associated uh, no, let me stop there. No buffer for boats associated with the marine educational area proposal. Um, the issue of, of drones will be removed from the proposal because of the other rulemaking process that's ongoing and may address the concern. Uh, 
no additional recommendation about uh, no kites or the, the 2000 foot buffer for airplanes. Uh, the issue of statutory vegetation line is, is, is not an issue any longer with the group uh, reconciling our recommendation with yours and that being kind of a, a mean high water boundary established, even though the ODFNW regs as mentioned would, would apply from extreme high water to extreme low water. Uh, that's my summary for the, the Chapman Point, now Marine Educational Area. If I move on to uh, the Ecola Point Marine Conservation Area, um, there would be uh, intertidal uh, habitat uh, restrictions applied to both uh, invertebrates and algae. There would, there would not be any additional restrictions applied to the subtitle. And the um, recommendations for walking on the rocks and for off-leash pets would be uh, removed, recognizing the need for non-regulatory management education and stewardship uh, messages be delivered to address the problem. Uh, I think that I heard during our conversations and related to the recommended 500 foot buffer for boats that the group was amenable to removing that recommendation and the uh, 2000 buffer, 2000 foot buffer for airplanes, drones, and kites, again, uh, would not be, uh, I guess, recommended any longer, uh, given the previous comment about the, the drone regulations and education and outreach being used to educate people about disturbance. And lastly, the, the vegetation line, again, would be reconciled back to the mean high water line. I will stop there. Um, panelists, is there, was there any clarification or additional things that I did not say or did say, but got kind of incorrect? I think you captured it. All right. Um, at this time, I think then we can go to our our next public comment opportunity. Um, I recognize that there has been a number of folks on the line listening to our panel and maybe wanting to speak up. So I will uh, initiate the public comment opportunity now. And Nadia Gardner has raised her hand. I think that's for public comment. So Nadia, take it away. Thank you, Andy. Um... Uh, I want to first thank Andy and his staff, as well as all the volunteers and Jesse Jones and um, Kristen Bain and Margaret Treadwall, who put just numerous hours into their um, proposal here and spent all crazy day, half, half the day to day um, in this meeting. It was, um, it's just really impressive how a small group, such a passionate group can pull together so much information. And I really want to honor them and their expertise and, and the time that they put into it, many of them as volunteers. So um, thank you. And I also want to thank the um, other agency staff who have spent time giving feedback on these proposals. I really appreciate that as well. Um, in terms of my like public feedback, I, I've, I've got to say I um, am disappointed in some of the watering down of the proposal. Um, you know, the, some of the agency staff encouraging that. I think, you know, these are people who know this site the best. They understand that you don't have to step on a rock to walk through there. I've been walking through that gap in the rocks to Crescent Beach for 20 years, and I've never had to step on a rock, <laughs> you know? So that um, fear that comes through is out, uh, out of lack of knowledge of the site. And um, I think that, you know, we need to trust the public and the public being the volunteers in the room that, understand and also love walking through there as public themselves, um, that that might be the right thing for this location because um, you can tide pool very easily without stepping on a rock in that, in that spot. Not everywhere, but there, yes. Um, I also want to acknowledge that, um, well, I want to rank, um, you know, thank uh, Chief Shermerhorn, who's been on the call also, which is huge, having a police chief willing to sit in on these um, conversations. 
And um, so I, I really want to honor Cannon Beach in, in stepping up um, enforcement, especially around the, the fireworks ban there, which is huge both for people and for pets and wildlife. Um, and I have to note that, yes, there are a lot of rules in place protecting, for example, nesting birds, um, but generally, um, and then also the leash laws, but generally those are not enforced at all by um, pretty much anybody, right? <laughs> it's, it's up to the volunteers, the neighbors to, to go up to people and say, hey, you know, this, there's this nesting bird here. Would you possibly you know, put your dog on leash. And it's a lot to put on the public to do that. And, and I'll say like, it is really helpful to have laws in place. Um, I, I think about going and visiting Angela Whitlock down at the beach last year um, at, at Short Sands and her being overwhelmed by the amount of issues that are going on down there and her not having to be the, you know, her having, feeling like she had to be the person to enforce and that's really not fair <laughs> to put on interpretive people. Um, and so I think we need to decide as a state what our priorities are. And maybe that's enlisting the help uh, of our local municipalities. But um, you know, when I was a kid, Portland was 300,000 people. And now it's 4 million, um, or sorry, it's 2.5 million. And Seattle is now 4 million. Um, we live in a different place today than we did 20 years ago and 20 years before that. And so we do need to start strengthening our rules, and then we need to strengthen our enforcement if we want to keep our state as incredible as it is today. And um, so, you know, I think sometimes there's pushback from the agencies on community groups like this one, you know, to to instigate new new rules. Um, but I I think sometimes it takes a little group like this to instigate the change that needs to happen over time. And so um, thanks to all of you for spending the time today on this. And I hope we'll be able to get these designations and be able to make the changes that we need to make um, both on a regulatory side and an enforcement side and a compliance education side, of course, um, over time. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. Is there anyone else that would like to provide public comment? I think Charlie, you'd asked earlier. Uh, yeah, thanks, Andy, for the record. Charlie Plyvin, um, Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. Uh, I appreciate uh, all the time from everyone here in the discussion. Uh, this is a bit different of a proposal, and so I'm still trying to wrap my head around a number of things, um, particularly for the Ecola point one. Um, but the I really like the the approach with the marine education area at Chapman Point. Um, it, 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 I, I remember having a lot of conversations within the working group that were all very supportive of that idea there, even though that wasn't what was proposed. And so I wanna just remind folks that that was a discussion within the working group and people did recognize that as an opportunity. Um, I also, and this isn't me opposing that, that designation, but I, I really wanna speak to the people that live in that community, particularly in that neighborhood. Oak Street, Laurel Street, 7th Street, 5th Street. Um, this is an invitation for more people to come there. Um, and it, it will be, and, and I know you said that that's coming no matter what. Um, but I, I think it's important to meet that need uh, with shoreside infrastructure. Um, and so I think that it's important for that community to maybe think about what do you want long-term parking uh, to look like uh, in the interest of inclusivity and accessibility. It's important you know, to make that site accessible as a marine education area. Um, so how many parking spaces is good? Where would you put those parking spaces? Bathrooms, these are the problems I deal with at other designated sites. Um, the people in the community of Otter Rock are physically trying to create a fee there. They're trying to stop people from coming there. Um, these are problems in other communities. So as a recreational user, um, I have long loved to go up there and surf. Uh, I parked my car right up there at that top little access. I know how much room is there. Um, I also know what, how terrible it would probably be for that community if there were hundreds of cars there. Um, so thinking long-term about how you wanna control that, I really think that's important for the city of Cannon Beach and for this community with this designation. And you gotta think 20 years down the road. Um, this isn't about just like what you're seeing today. Uh, and that's just what I've seen just being on a lot of rule advisory committees uh, and participating in a lot of these processes over the years. So. Thanks so much. I really do appreciate everybody's time here. This is great work and I really appreciate the progress on these proposals. So thanks for you. 
Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Uh, Deb and then Peggy. Deb, you are on mute still. Let me help you. Thank you. Um, the areas around Chapman and Ecola Point um, are among the most beautiful areas of the earth, as we all know. And the Canopy area was listed as the one, one of the top 100 most beautiful places on earth in National Geographic. And in 2017 was also mentioned as one of the top 21 beaches in the world. Our Chamber of Commerce is promoting people to go there. Um, the parking, there's a lot of surfers at Chap Chapman Point and there's a strip to park there. The Cannon Beach, City of Cannon Beach is dealing currently with a parking plan and are very active in doing that. Um, I, I think Jason could speak to that. We have a great police chief, uh, Jason, who will speak to that. And, um, you know, the, the time is now. We've got to secure our future for nature and we must look ahead with the idea of preservation so that these healthy habitats will exist in the future. And time really matters. And we must do all we can to protect what is sacred. Um, we're making big choices right now. This is this group is, is it's it's big. Um, it's in, I'm, we have to inspire ourselves to make this happen. And the time to act is now. So as far as what's happening there, it, it's going to happen, and it's happening. And if we don't take measures to protect it it will have happened and we'll be regretting that we didn't act sooner. So um, that's my input. It's my favorite place in the world and I've traveled a lot and it's, it's much too sacred to um, not do the optimal best for it. So um, uh, Chief Jason might be able to speak a little bit to the parking plan um, because he's probably well, much more informed on that than I am. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I will offer Jason an opportunity to speak on that if he wants, because it's been brought up. Thank you so much, Deb. <laughs> the uh, parking uh, in the North End hasn't really been addressed as part of the parking study, just because there's very limited area to expand or create parking up there. But it is more of a having people um, get the shuttles or whatnot to get them to those areas. And that's all about the education is park in one of the public parking lots and then shuttle to those areas. And um, so that's part of that study is making sure that that information is getting out and about to people so they're aware that they can park elsewhere and get taken to that location. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Peggy Joyce. Thank you, Andy, and uh, thanks so much to everyone on this panel uh, and all of the state employees and the U.S. federal employees. I mean, I I just cannot tell you how overwhelmed I feel with the extent and the um, with the extent of the problem, but I'm also very much heartened by the extent of the collaboration that is taking place and the cooperation that is taking place, because it just seems to me that the message I'm hearing from everyone on this call is that people are waking up to we're all in this together and we better get together with ourselves to leverage I mean, look at the power that exists in this location among these people who have put their time and their energy into bringing forth this proposal. I mean, I, I'm just overwhelmed by this and I'm so touched by all of your work. And I am so honored to be uh, able to be a part of this right now because this is really important stuff. I mean, we are talking about life and death issues here, actually, really for all of us. This is the planet that we live on. And if we don't do something like now, begin to do something, we're not going to solve it. But we have got to step forward really strongly and say, we cannot, we cannot wait any longer for people to get manners before they walk on the beach. They need to be told that they need to have manners. We expect this kind of behavior from citizens. This is not acceptable. And we all have to learn how to live with each other. 
in spite of all of our differences. So I am pledging to you guys that I am, I just marked it on my calendar. I'm taking the week of May 8th and I am gonna travel from one end of the coast uh, line to the other to visit every single one of these sites because I cannot sit on this board and not know what the hell I am voting on or talking about, or even what what is this proposal tell me? I mean, everything that I have heard in the last three days I say, yes, sure, I think that's terrific. I don't still know what I'm voting on, but I'm going to vote for, I am going to vote with my feet by going to every single location so that I know what it looks like so that I can talk to hopefully some of you that I've met and watched online and educate myself so that I feel comfortable sitting there and saying, okay, here's what we need to do. Like beach, Rangers, I have never heard of that. What a great idea. I want more of those. I want those people to be on every single damn beach. Why not? This is how we communicate with people. It's absolutely true. I think doing brochures is wonderful, but I think absolutely the best effect is is one-on-one, face-to-face. You have to stand in someone's energy field and say, okay, what's going on here? How can I connect with this person? How can I communicate with this person? I mean, it's, oh, people, I love all of you. I mean, I am just so impressed with all of you on this call, Um, all the state workers. I really, really honor what you guys are doing with so little resources. I am just crazy about getting more resources to our state agencies. This is just, um, it's unacceptable to live with this kind of restriction on something that is so vital to our actual existence on this planet. I'm done. That's it. Thank you, everyone who's provided comments. Is there anyone else who would like to provide a public comment today? Okay. Well, let me share my screen uh, one more time just to remind folks that um, there will be public comment opportunities coming up. both in June at the OPAC meeting and this fall. Um, And if the uh, designations move forward, my commission will will do rule amendment uh, where there will also be an opportunity to comment. Um, And I'm sure that uh, folks would really, I think, benefit from hearing uh, the perspectives that have been shared uh, throughout the workshop today, but throughout all of the workshops that we've conducted this week. Um, So that is it for today. Uh, I just wanted to provide uh, one last opportunity for uh, questions or clarifications before we adjourn. Otherwise, I will release you a little bit early for your Friday afternoon activities. Thank you so much, Andy, and all of the state uh, parks and agency staff and feds who were here today. Thank you so much. I will just echo that sentiment and say meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time, and we will see you in June. All right, thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye, take care.